call the select board meeting for Wednesday, October 21st, 2020 to order. First order of business is the consent agenda. We have warrants AP 2116, AP 2116S, AP 2117-2, AP 2117, AP 2117-S. So move. Yeah, second. Okay. And I'm going to wait just a sec. I thought Christian was there. There's Christian. Christian, we've just done the consent agenda, just the, the warrants. We have a motion in a second. Did you have any discussion on those? Thank you. Christian, can you hear me? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I just signed on. Is it? Did you guys start already? Yeah, I thought you were there. I apologize. Uh, we, oh. we started the consent agenda. We just have warrants. We have a motion and a second. I just, if you had any discussion you wanted to about the warrants. Oh, no. Nope. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> any further discussion from anybody else? All right. All those. In yes. What? Um, any select board discussion? This is a warrant articles for this. The, uh, Consent agendas. Consent agenda. All right. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. And then we're going to, we have Linda Sanderson here. And uh, Linda, is David Eisenthal here yet or no? Mm. Yeah. Okay. So we'll go ahead and uh, we're going to go to the uh, what do we have here? The restorative justice program for the Hadley Police Department so we can get Chief Mason out of here. Uh, Chief, last meeting, uh, Mr. Fighten brought up some questions about the restorative justice program and I, I didn't know enough about it to comment. So do you wanna kind of introduce it and how we got here and what this program is? And I see he's here tonight, so. Yep. Absolutely, I, I would be happy to. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. All right. Um, so we were approached uh, uh, probably a couple of months ago from the district attorney's office that they're interested in partnering with uh, not only Hadley PD, but several other police departments in Hampshire and Franklin County for a restorative justice program. Uh, they wanted to take a different approach uh, when it comes to certain crimes that are committed um, within, the, within our two counties so long as they fit certain categories. Um, the idea behind it is to uh, try to involve, um, it, it basically restorative justice is, is a process where, you know, the offender, uh, victims, and even members of the community, I'm sure you probably saw within our post that um, they look for volunteers from this community to be involved in this process as well. Uh, so if you have a situation where there isn't an actual victim, uh, that can be named, for example, if somebody sprays graffiti on a building or something like that, you can have members of your actual, of your community uh, work collectively to, you know, try to identify what the harm was and, and try to get whoever the offender is to, you know, make reparations to, you know, whoever the victim is or the community in these types of situations. Um, I know that you know, there was a concern, uh, David, you know, you and I discussed this, that there's a concern that, um, you know, serious crimes would be diverted into a restorative justice process. Uh, that's, that is not going to happen. Um, I'm actually working on our draft policy right now. Um, I've seen a couple of different policies from uh, some other police departments that are already utilizing this same program in this same format. Uh, it's, a, it's a voluntary pro, uh, process. It's voluntary not only for the victim, but also for the offender. And there are certain um, criteria that must be met in order for these cases to be allowed to be diverted into the restorative justice process. Uh, the victim has to be willing. Uh, they have, if, if, like I said, it's completely voluntary. If they are against this happening, 
um, this, this then charges get filed and it goes through a court process. Uh, the offender actually has to have admitted to committing the offense before it, that's an, another one of the criteria that it, uh, it, that must be met before it could go into this process. And they actually have to show uh, some type of remorse and, and a desire to repair the harm that they've done. Uh, and the, the police department and the district attorney's office, one of the final criteria is that they must be able to assure a, a safe process. Uh, you know, we don't want to put people in the same room together to mediate some type of issue if there's any danger that any further harm could be caused. There are specific crimes which will never be diverted um, unless there's some type of extenuating circumstance. Uh, OUIs, alcohol or drugs will not be diverted uh, into restorative justice. Um, certain types of unlicensed operation, leaving the scene of a property damage or PI, a, a personal injury accident, will never be diverted. Sexual assaults or any other related offenses will not be diverted. Domestic violence, any cases with vulnerable populations like the elderly or children will never be diverted. Um, crimes involving violent, any type of violence against a person, um, especially with strangulation, assault and battery with dangerous weapons, uh, standard assault and batteries, armed robberies, mayhems, none of that will be diverted. Uh, harassment and restraining order violations will not be diverted. So I've been a police officer for 20 years now, um, worked in Hampshire County. I'm well aware that there are certain cases that just simply uh, are handled very leniently. Um, the, the, I, I would never have gone into this process and accepted, uh, this, uh, and agreed to work with this restorative justice program. If I thought it was going to become more lenient and take away the rights, uh, in a crime that I know should be prosecuted. The idea behind this is to try to find some other outlet, some other way to repair the harm when we know that the court system and law enforcement can't effectively deal with what happened. Uh, a lot of the cases that sort of justice, uh, the, the restorative justice program, the one that we are using, uh, divert right now have to do with what I just mentioned. Uh, there was a case with, I want to say it's Brockton, Mass, or something like that. One of those, one of the big cities. I was on a conference call last week where um, some three youths spray painted swastikas uh, on a few town buildings or city buildings in their community. Police department did an investigation, uh, able to locate these three individuals, and the case was it was determined with a consultation between the district attorney's office and the police department. Uh, and the managers of the buildings they wanted to try something different. And this is the process that they used. Um, the, you know, the people were allowed to come in and explain to these young people what doing something like that, how that made them feel. And um, remorse was shown. The, swast the, the, the um, graffiti was cleaned up. They, you know, did what they had to do to resolve the case. And most of us who've been in law enforcement long enough know that if that case had gone to a criminal hearing, much less than that would have come out of it. So um, I hope that kind of encapsulates much of uh, what the process is about. I, like I said, I have a draft policy in front of me. If anybody, Mr. Fiden or anyone else would like me to email to them. I'm happy to do that. You can read through it and we can have a back and forth one-on-one -on -one, uh, email or phone call and I can try to answer any other questions that people have. But you know, like I said, I was the, the intent is never ever to remove, um, remove uh, any of the rights that a victim has in, in these cases and simply hope that with a different approach, we can have some effect where in a, in a standard court hearing or um, regular process, we weren't getting that. Is that, that's best I can do for right now. Mr. Fiden, you had a couple of questions last time. Did you have any follow-ups for the chief on, on that? 
Yeah, yeah I, I would like to follow up, and I know uh, I don't want to take up all of the time here, so I'll try to be very, uh, very concise in just getting out some, some of my concerns. Uh, basically, I'm familiar with uh, restorative justice from, you know, doing reading. It, it, is, it is something that's been uh, talked about in our school system. Uh, and I was surprised to see this come out uh, in, our, in our town. I'm not a fan of it for several reasons. One is because it's not, in my, in my view, in my research, it's not really evidence-based. And I think, um, I think if when, you, when you start to look at the studies that have been done on this, uh, that, that becomes very clear that the evidence uh, is not really there to back, to, to support this kind, of, uh, this kind of a program. And for an example, I'll give you is on the, um, I guess it's C4RJ, but that's the, the program that we're working with now. And if, yep. you go, if you go to their website, there is a page, it's the first page that I went to, to see what this program was all about, this this local program, it's not really local, it's um, near Boston, but um, to see what it was all about, I went to the page that was called Success Data, and it has a list of very impressive uh, statistics on that page. And uh, the two that were interesting to me were uh, recidivism and also uh, reparation. Uh, and in both of those cases, the programs claimed that they um, they made a really impressive claim as far as recidivism. And that was also mentioned by several of the police chiefs in the newspaper for, uh, as their reason for supporting this. And uh, it was pretty impressive. And I started to, and I wanted to look at those two, those two factors. And I clicked on the link. They did have a link that said this was based on a nationwide study of restorative justice programs. So I, I kind of tracked that down. Uh, and when you go to the, when you go to the page, it opens up a, it's not a nationwide study. It's an article, really. It's a compilation of. It's an article by a by a professor who is a professor of restorative justice and who makes his living off of this, and it's from 1998. And um, he in the in this article he cites a number of um, of program of studies that have been done, but mostly he cites his own work, and it's uh, that was kind of a red flag to me when. Uh, when someone's citing their own work as a, it, it doesn't doesn't have as much credibility. Um, but I dug a little deeper into so, some of his own work, and I went to the um, the information on recidivism. And he does, he it, it's from one of his books from 1994. So we're getting back there. We're going, and some of the research was even earlier. It's going back, you know, in, into the 80s. Um, and uh, what, what bothered me was that he did have those numbers in there. He did, but it wasn't a nationwide study. It was based on three different programs from the early 90s or 80s. And he came up with those numbers. But he also, uh, he also actually admitted that these numbers, um, they were not statistically significant. So in other words, after digging deep into these numbers, the, the person who wrote this article he said these don't mean very much. They were not significant, statistically significant. So, and yet, and then basically, I'll try for sake of time, the same was true of reparations. It was based on two different studies from the early 90s, and um, and it really wasn't, it didn't mean very much. But somehow that made it onto the success data page of, of this organization. That bothered me. And because um, it's it's really not accurate. It says right on the page that this is based on um, you know a nationwide study of restorative justice programs, and you know I'm in advertising and you can't make those kind of claims, at least in the private sector, and, and get away with it because um, it, it's, it's just yeah if you make a claim you have to back it up. In my mind this wasn't backed up, so that to me is is kind of this is kind of disqualifying because. I did look into other research, and there are there are some more recent studies, and they don't they just don't support it. There are two RAND studies from 2019. Most of these are school based because this is very popular in, in schools because of uh, uh, some recent Obama administration um, uh, programs that they they wanted to promote, and um, basically the it 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 hasn't done what it's proclaimed to do. I mean, the, the two recent RAND studies, it, in, in, there was, uh, I believe it's Pittsburgh and Maine. In Pittsburgh, the, 
uh, test scores went actually down in, in a middle school, especially among black students. And in the main study, it, it showed basically no difference as far as bullying and that type of thing. So um, that might explain why their success data is kind of outdated and, and not, not really useful. And, and frankly, it's just in, in, inaccurate. So uh, that, that did bother me. And, and uh, as I mentioned a few weeks ago, um, restorative justice has been, uh, it's actually been disavowed by our own justice department and, and our own department of education uh, following the Parkland uh, massacre. The, the, the school safety commission studied studied this. This is one of the factors that they studied, and, and uh, basically, it, I'll send it to you. Basically, they said that it was uh, uh, school teachers felt that they were pressured into keeping students in school. It was it, it wasn't accomplishing what they what they wanted to do, and it was it was a little bit dangerous. And um, in my own in my own reading, I've read a, a, a book called. Uh, why Meadow died, which is by a gentleman named uh, Andrew Pollock, who was one of the Parkland parents. And in this book, he goes into great de detail um, about restorative justice programs, this type of program. Now in Parkland, Florida, they had a program that was much more comprehensive than what we're talking about. It was called the, the Promise Program. And it integrated with the school department and the sheriff's department. And uh, it was a model that was held up and, but we, we all, we all saw what was what what happened there with um, you know such such a terrible tragedy. And what Mr. Pollock says was that, that this the Parkland massacre was the most uh, most avoidable um, school shooting in U in U.S. history. And kind of, I kind of took that to heart. And also he he said that um, he didn't he wanted to be the last father that didn't know what was going on in his town and in his school. So uh, this, this is something that. It, it, it was, it, it, it had it held a lot of weight with me. And, um, and when I, and when, I, as I said, when I went to their site, it just doesn't, it doesn't have much credibility when they're putting that kind of misleading information. A couple of things to, to the points that the, that the chief made, and I appreciate that we have our own, we have our own um, criteria for this, um, for running this program, but I'm, I'm looking at the, uh, the, 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 their website, their, actually their annual report, C4RJ right now. And, and this was something that the DA brought up in the, in the newspaper. He said, this is going to be, you know, this is going to be for vandalism, low level crimes. Um, but when you look at the website, it actually the, the top, most of the crimes are assaults and, and, and including 10.5% um, were felony assaults. And I'm not an expert on what a felony assault is, but I, I I, I'm sure it's 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 pretty serious. Let me let me let the chief jump in here because I think uh, my understanding is we have the ability to set our policy of what crimes are part of the program. So, chief, if you want to jump in on, on some of that, David, David, yeah. before anybody goes any further, could somebody and I'm being stupid right now because I am at certain extents. Um, could they please ex explain what recidivism is? Um, I think a lot of people, not only myself, I'm not familiar with that word. And I'd like a little bit of an explanation since it's been thrown out there and repeated uh, on several times here. Yeah. And I'd like a, an explanation of it. it. It's basically when somebody commits a crime again or goes back to crime. So if you've been convicted of a crime, uh, you know, it's, it's talking about there's aging out and things like that. As you get older, people tend to commit less crimes. People tend to uh, get in trouble less. Uh, the recidivism rate is how often those people go back to, you know, a life of crime or committing crimes. Okay, that's, so that, people, that, that, people that have been rehabbed and uh, whether or not they go back or not, is that how it is? Basically. Exactly. Basically. And, and on their website, it, it does say, it says the, the following data comes from a U.S.-wide study on restorative justice programs. And they, they have a, a chart. Recidivism for traditional criminal justice is 27%. Restorative justice is 18%. As I, as I just explained, there's no basis for that. That should not be on that site. Honestly, well, let's, something let's just jump in and talk a little bit about. I just uh, want to finish. I, I, don't, I think that's the kind of thing that is, the DA mentioned that, and this is the kind of thing we should be preventing, this kind of marketing or, or promotion, not signing on to, in my view. Go ahead, Chief. 
Okay. Um, yeah. So as far as uh, recidivism and, and reparations, um, you know, the statistics that, that they have on their website, I don't know what metrics the district itself has used to determine that this was the company that, that they wanted to, to work with. Um, I don't know that there are other companies that do this, but uh, within their research, they wanted to find an alternative to charging people with crimes when both the victim and the offender didn't want to go down that road. Um, as far as, uh, you know, uh, restorative justice programs being some type of cause for school shootings or low test scores, I don't know how you draw that nexus, um, but, you know, I, I don't really, I don't really have a comment to that because I don't know how you make that connection. Um, as far as the assaults and felonious assaults and all that, um, as Chair Phil just mentioned, we have the ability to work with the district attorney's office and determine whether or not cases are going to be def uh, deferred uh, into this program. And the victim themselves has the authority, almost the sole authority to determine whether or not that happens. The one assault case that they talked about in uh, my last meeting was a mutual combat assault, which I think is probably most of what you're seeing there, where two people get into a fight with one another. Uh, there are no other victims, so to speak. And rather than charge both of these individuals with assault and battery and disorderly conduct on one another, they offer them the opportunity to go through this program. Uh, as far as reparations go, that's a huge part for me because if the example like the, uh, the uh, graffiti, if that isn't taken care of, this case goes to criminal trial. Um, that is part of the authority that we hold when these, when these cases get diverted, that the, the case must be fulfilled to the satisfaction of those involved. So if you have an offender who's simply sitting there, quiet, not participating, successfully completing the process to the satisfaction of the victim, the C4RJ, the district attorney's office, and the police department, this case then can get referred back to criminal trial. So there's multiple safeguards uh, you know, within this process. As far as any of the other stuff you brought up with statistics and school shootings and I, I I can't speak to that I don't I don't know um, where those connections lie I, I appreciate that and the uh, uh, as I said it's it's the most of these statistics are referring to school-based programs because that is where it re has really um, become popular in the last few years since 2014 and uh, up until the last I believe it's two years ago when it was um, recommended that uh, by the Justice Department and the Department of Education that schools get away from that. And this, this is, I know this is a, this is for uh, adult offenders, or at least uh, it's a community program and not, not a school program. And I, I just have a couple of quick points, maybe that, that the chief, uh, well, just to bring out and then uh, you can move on, is that the, one of the things that I, that I, that I don't like is what is, uh, about the program is that it is, it is basically a victim, uh, a victim and an offender based program and it's actually confidential and it, uh, it, it they go into, uh, people go in, into the program and it's not, it's, it's not the traditional system where we have, which, which is a community, crimes are community issues. Whereas if, if the home next to me is robbed tonight, that's not only going to affect my neighbor, it's going to affect me. It's, it's the same with graffiti or assaults or any crime. The tradition has been that that affects the whole community. And that's, that's one of the great things about our justice system is that it is community based and people do have to go to a public forum uh, and, and, and it, it be, be, um, be judged in, in that format. And um, the, I think that's one of the great things that I, I really would not, like to get away from that and finally so the just just let me let me just jump in really quick just to to comment on that on the on the confidentiality part the only part of the process that's confidential is the actual 
uh, meeting that occurs, everything up to that point is public record. There, there will be a report done. It will go to the district attorney's office. There's a victim named if there is a victim. Uh, there's a suspect named. The juvenile laws will still apply. So if you're dealing with a juvenile, that name is redacted, but that would be redacted no matter what. So it's just the act, the process that's confidential is just the last part of the process where the victim has agreed to enter into this process. So I think that's the other part of it. And I agree with you 100%. Part of what I like about our, our system is that it is out in the open and anyone can attend. Um, the problem is, is that in my experience, the opportunity for the victim or even others who are affected by the crime is severely stunted, especially in our counties, Franklin and Hampshire, where, the, where our district attorney handles cases, because of the caseload. And that's kind of the idea behind this. Like you, you don't go to court and then people don't get a chance to stand up and say, hey, this is how this made me feel. That doesn't happen, not in a regular court setting. So the idea behind this was that's not going to happen in a regular court setting. And the victim agrees to try to do this in another setting and the community wants to become involved. They then can become involved. That part of it is confidential, but it gives victims or people who are affected by it more of an opportunity, I think, to stand up and say, hey, this is how what you did affected me. And the part about robbing the, the neighbor next door's house, that's another crime not going to get diverted anyways. That's a, that's a, a, a significant felony. So I knew you were just, I know you're just throwing that out just to kind of give an example, but that one's not going to meet the criteria. Well, it is a, at least this is one of the, those are the crimes that the, that this, uh, they, they do deal with breaking and entering larceny, even hate crimes. Uh, so breaking and entering larceny, breaking and entering and larceny don't have to deal, don't have to do with actual human beings involved comes to home invasion or robbery, that's when an actual person is involved. It's a victim against a person. A B &E is something like somebody broke into your garage and stole your lawnmower. Um, totally different. Those, you know, anything with a human being involved where there is, you know, a, like you said, a robbery. Totally mm -hmm. robbery. And, and those will be looked at completely differently, especially by my standards. My, my, final, my final point, to, it's to to address one of your points is about my concern is about the victim. And I know you've, you've said several times and, and it's been made clear that this would be voluntary for the victims. I'm not, I'm not entirely comfortable with that. If, if, if the, because it, I, I, I just, I can see maybe not intentional, but a victim may feel pressured to participate. If the, if the police department, the DA, the DA and lawyers are, are coming and say, Hey, do you want to be responsible for this? this person going to jail. And, and I think there's a, there's an element of coercion to it. And then, and then that victim, and like I said, I'm just going based on what's on their site. They have harassment, crimes like that, assaults on there. If someone so is in there in a confidential situation, that, that uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not entirely comfortable with that, frankly. It's just- uh, And we, we gotta move on, but I just wanna say that, that is similar to any crime where the victim has to provide a statement for a report, has to, uh, you know, uh, basically talk about what happened. So, so I get it. There has to be some, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I don't want to press charges. You know, I don't, I don't want to get involved. So they, they kind of have to make that decision one way or another, whether it's going to a, a criminal court or they're being diverted anyways. But, um, but no, I, I can kind of see what you're saying at the same time. So um, we, we really do have to move on though, because this is taking longer than I, what, what I thought already. Um, I, I know that, and I don't want to cut you off. So if you have more questions, uh, maybe get with the chief and I'm sure he'll be happy to answer any of the questions you have. Yeah, Mr. Fiden, please uh, please shoot me an email or, or give me a call. Or if, if you're comfortable, send your phone number in an email. I'm happy to talk further about this. You bring up some good points. And to be quite honest with you, I would be 100% willing to uh, consider making some adjustments to the policy based on some of your recommendations um, to ensure especially that last point that you just made um, that there is no pressure. There is a whole section on 
how these cases will get referred. So I'm happy to, to discuss any of those details with you. Thank you, Chief, and thank you to the select board. Appreciate it. Any uh, comments from the select board on this or any last questions before we move on? No. All right, thanks, Chief. All right, we're gonna jump over to Linda and David Eisenthal and uh, they have an update on borrowing. So Linda and David, I'll let you take it away and uh, give us the good news. Linda on. May I ask a question? Uh, no, ma'am. We're working with uh, Mr. Eisenthal and, and Linda the treasurer at this point. Okay. Um. Okay. I don't see Linda on, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. I, I think I'll just. Uh, She's just reconnecting right now, David. Okay. I'll, I'll wait for Linda. Okay. There she is. Yeah. She <laughs> must be having internet problems again. I, I was. I was. So I did just log back in and um, hopefully I'll, I'm here to stay. <laughs> okay. Yes. Did you start? Yeah, tell us, tell us the good news. We were waiting for you on the bond. Oh, okay. Yeah, we have. Uh, we do have good news on the bond. We have our. Uh, we uh, went out to bid last week, and um, David will go into a little more detail. But we have interest rate of under two percent, one point nine five five percent, and we've got a whole stack of materials for select board to sign over the next couple of days, which we'll we'll schedule with you also, and. Um, just as a reminder, this is our last financing, final last financing for all uh, all three of the buildings that the town has purchased and um, funded and, and uh, financed and uh, built over the last couple of years. And uh, one more reminder that we keep needing to tell people is there will be no, uh, that the increase, the debt exclusion increase on their tax bills to pay for these buildings has already happened. It will not the debt exclusion will not be going up by reason of this financing, just as it has not specifically gone up for any others in the last three years. In fact, because of our low interest rates, we may actually, we'll probably be seeing a decrease um, much sooner than anticipated, but more on that another time after we had, we've had a chance to uh, meet um, about budgets. So- um, They're here. Go ahead, David Eisenfall. Thank you for all of your help. You're welcome. Thank you, uh, Ms. through you, Mr. Chairman. Um, there, I believe that there's going to be a vote uh, in front of the select board uh, that will approve the issuance of the seven million three hundred ten thousand uh, par amount of general obligation bonds. As Linda said, this uh, issue completes the permanent financing of the local share of the library, the fire substation, and the senior center. Uh, the town has uh, $5,370,000 worth of bands that will mature November 12th. Those will be paid with proceeds of the bond issue. And uh, some other proceeds will provide the final new money, what we call new money, for those projects. And in addition, there is additional financing for the ongoing stormwater project. Uh, the structure of this issue is a nearly 30-year repayment um the um uh, this is being done on a level debt service basis uh, like a mortgage uh the first interest that will be payable on this on august 1st of 2021 first principal february 1st 2022 and then the whole uh transaction is fully paid off february 1st 2050. um as linda said we uh the town took bids last week october 15th uh, I'll make the comment that uh, the bond market last week in this country was very busy. Um, issuers were trying to stay ahead of the presidential election, as actually the town of Hadley yep. uh, was doing. We had originally planned to uh, have the bids the last week in October, uh, but moved that a little bit further away to avoid what we thought might be some market turmoil but because of the volume in large part uh the town received two bids which uh, i will say is a less than optimal result but the winning underwriter piper sandler has had a true interest cost of 1.95 percent 
when you add in the cost of issuance, uh, you're just a lit, just a hair above 2%. Uh, now comparing that to the July 2019 issue, the first issue that financed the library uh, fire mm -hmm. substation and senior center, that went out at uh, what was then a very low rate of 2.7%, mm -hmm. probably about high two sevens, including the issuance cost. So rates are definitely lower than they were in um, uh, in the summer of 2019, I mean, we're recommending, uh, and we've been recommend, we have recommended, and are recommending that the town proceed with this. Uh, uh, we didn't expect that the uh, true interest cost would be below two percent. Um, I will give you uh, a couple of other details that uh, Linda will be taking delivery of the proceeds on the 29th. Uh, of uh, October, which is a week from tomorrow, and uh, the notes, the outstanding notes, mature on November 12th. Um, Linda, I don't. I'll, Mr. Chair, I, I guess I'll ask Linda if she wants to say anything about the bond rating before I go ahead and do that. Um, go right ahead, David. Okay. Do you want? To? Yes. You, you, may to, you should. Okay. Take so. Um, the town, as it did uh, in uh, June and July of 2019, the set town sought a rating of S&P Global Ratings. Uh, the, uh, uh, the town, we organized a conference call with uh, analysts from S&P on October 2nd. The result of this review was an affirmation of the AAA rating with stable outlook, which the town was upgraded to the AAA last year from the AA plus. Uh, I'll, ref I'll uh, pass along the comments that um, the S&P views the town as uh, continuing to have uh, financial and management strength. And they also see the local economy as very strong, reflecting the strength of the regional economy. Uh, S&P did cite the COVID pandemic as presenting risks for the economy that could pressure the town's finances in the next few years, although they are saying that at this point, they haven't seen much evidence of this so far. So um, that's really all I have. I'll turn it back to uh, Chair or to, uh, to Linda. What, was there a uh, specific language that we needed to read for the motion? And that? Um, I think that came in the package that is there. I was looking through it, but it's very long and I may have missed <laughs> the actual motion. Okay. Uh, that's okay. We can, uh, I think Jennifer. Uh, the, I think the important part of that is, and Linda, I think is. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, if okay. I start, how about so, if I start with. There is, there is a vote and it is in what was sent to you. There's just so much was sent to you. Now I, 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 now I see that I should have said it separately. So let me tell you where it is. Um, oh, uh, Linda, Linda yep. can, you, can you read it? And then I will approve it. Sure. I don't have it in front of me. Sure, it goes on for uh, four pages. But, um, okay, how about um, I find which page it is on, on War Docs and what I sent to you, and meanwhile, is there something more to talk with, David? It, well, okay, uh, let me start by reading it. It says, uh, this is what the clerk is going to be certifying, um, and the clerk, I believe, is Christian Stanley? Correct. Is, is that right? Okay. Um, he certifies that at a meeting of the board, held October 21, 2020, of which meeting all members of the board were duly notified and at which a quorum was present, the following votes were unanimously passed, all of which appear upon the official record of the board in my custody. Voted that the sale of the 7,310,000 general obligation municipal purpose loan of 2020 bonds, unlimited tax of the town dated October 29, 2020, the bonds to Piper Sandler and Company at the price of 
$0.40 cents and accrued interest, if any, is hereby approved and confirmed. The bonds shall be payable on February 1 of the years and in the principal amounts and bear interest at the respective rates as follows. And there is a chart of the amounts due and when they're due. And that is in your materials. Further voted that the bonds maturing on February 1, 2032, February 1, 2034, 36, 38, 40, each of those February 1 years shall be subject to mandatory redemption or mature as follows. Term bond, and then for each of the years, it gives the amounts that are due at that time. And that goes on for a page, a page and a half. And again, I can give you the specific reference to this uh, in your materials afterwards, but rather than read that entire chart, I will go on to the further voted that in connection with the marketing and sale of the bonds, the preparation and distribution of a notice of sale and preliminary official statement dated October 7, 2020, and a final official statement dated October 15, 2020, the official statement, each in such form as may be approved by the town treasurer, Treasurer B and hereby are ratified, confirmed, approved, and adopted. Further voted that the bonds shall be subject to redemption at the option of the town upon such terms and conditions as are set forth in the official statement. Further voted that the town treasurer and the select board B and hereby are authorized to execute and deliver a continuing disclosure undertaking in compliance with SEC rule 15C2-12 in such forms as may be approved by bond council to the town, which undertaking shall be incorporated by reference in the bonds as applicable for the benefit of the holders of the bonds from time to time. Further voted that we authorize and direct the town, town treasurer to establish post issuance federal tax compliance procedures and continuing disclosure procedures in such forms as the town treasurer in order to monitor and maintain the tax exempt status of the bonds and to comply with relevant securities laws. Further voted that any certificates or documents relating to the bonds may be executed in several counterparts, each of which shall be regarded as an original and all of which shall constitute one in the same document. Delivery of an executed counterpart of a signature page to a document by electronic mail in a PDF file or by other electronic transmission shall be as effective as delivery, as delivery of a manually executed counterpart signature page to such document and electronic, electronic signatures on any of the documents shall be deemed original signatures for the purposes of the documents and all matters relating thereto having the same legal effect as original signatures. Final further voted that each member of the select board, the town clerk and the town treasurer be and hereby are authorized to take any and all such actions and execute and deliver such certificates, receipts or other documents as may be determined by them or any of them to be necessary or convenient to carry into effect the provisions of the foregoing votes. I, um, and then the clerk will further certify that the votes were taken at a meeting open to the public that no vote was taken by secret ballot, that a notice stating the place, date, time, and agenda for the meeting, which agenda included the adoption of the about votes, was filed with the town clerk and a copy thereof posted in a manner conspicuously visible to the public at all hours in or on the municipal building that the office of the town clerk is located or if applicable in accordance with an alternative method of notice prescribed or approved by the attorney general is set forth in 940 CMR 29.032B, at least 48 hours, not including Saturdays, Sundays, and legal holidays prior to the time of the meeting, and remain so posted at the time of the meeting that no deliberations or decisions in connection with the sale of bonds were taken ex in executive session, all in accordance with General Laws Chapter 30A, Sections 18 to 25, as amended, further suspended, supplemented, or modified by the executive order of the governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, chapter 30A, section 20, dated March 12, 2020. That's it. Almost. So, so moved. <laughs> Second. Right. So have, uh, let me just uh, make sure I got that. Christian, you made the motion. Uh, Joyce seconded. 
And yes. then uh, Jennifer's going to roll call vote this. So that way we all are on record and this is all perfect. Right. And, and then Christian will be on his own uh, certifying this vote, um, the, the pages that I just wrote, uh, read. <laughs> okay. Roll call vote. Phil? Yes. Chungaloo? Yes. Stanley? Yes. Waskevitz? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Thank you. All right. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, um, Linda and David, and thank you for uh, all your hard work with the S&P review, uh, rating review. Um, glad we got that out of the way for another year or so. So I appreciate all, all the hard work. David, Perfect. Phil, you had also asked um, about a comparison of interest rates, which uh, David Eisenthal is prepared to give at this uh, time. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Right, because as you recall, we had originally when we, um, well, some as you recall, um, we had uh, projected uh, these buildings at 5% interest and um, what, four, four years ago. And um, we have done better than that. And I think David Phil asked at the last meeting, um, how, what, what does that actually mean? So uh, David Eisenthal can... Well, Mr. Chair, uh, what I did is I took both bond issues, last July's issue and this issue, and ran them as if they were uh, done at 5%, which was the original um, uh, projected interest rate, and then compared that to the actual interest uh, that uh, will be paid by the town uh, on these issues. And the difference is about $8 million over the 30 or so years. So, uh, wow. eight million dollars. Yeah, that's huge. That's why thank we you. will. Yeah. Thank you to you and to David Nixon and all the people that worked to get us that rating because it really makes a huge difference, as you have just said. That, that basically buys us another building, is what it amounts to. <laughs> <laughs> Any take? Not quite. Not quite the Russell School, but I I do appreciate our uh, financial team, Linda. Um, the collector, uh, Sue, um, David Eisenthal. I mean, everybody just works for David Nixon and Carol now, Carolyn that's now in on this also. Um, it really takes a village to get all these things done. And we so appreciate your job. We, we really thank you for your, what you do for the town of Hadley. Thank you. It was the right time to do these buildings. It, it, yep. it really was. Um, yeah, prove that, huh? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you. That's really a great percentage. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, thank you, David. Thanks for joining us. And thank you, Linda. All right. All right. Have a good That's night. Good. <laughs> and we'll get those signed. So uh, the select board, I assume, has to go sign them in front of uh, a notary this time, right? Um, yes. Well, uh, and, well, Jessica is in. Um, we would like them to, uh, to be sent back to town council, to uh, bond council by the end of the week. So if select board members could get into town hall, um, it, it would be nice to know exactly when you're coming so that we could all be there because you're each signing over 30 times. And so there's a lot of papers that we, that we wanna make sure you know, I'm there. Uh, we'll probably can, we can do it in Carolyn's office if uh, Jessica is busy or we can use her. So if you could be in touch with the select board office um, as to when you would like to be coming in Thursday or Friday, that would, really be helpful as far as our getting all of our ducks lined up and make sure that we don't miss any lines and, and get it all set. Okay. Perfect. All right. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good night. Thank you all. All right. Thank you. All right. Kathy Tudrin, are you still here? Yes, I am. All right. So uh, Hopkins, uh, Edward Hopkins Foundation, tell us what uh, you have for us this evening. Okay, um, I'm Kathy Tudor and I'm president of the Edward Hopkins Educational Foundation. And we are um, in our fourth year of giving grants to the teachers at Hadley Elementary and Hopkins Academy for materials and curriculum issues uh, that they cannot get through their regular budget process. Um, the foundation has accumulated books and materials relevant to the history of Hopkins and also to the history of the town. 
we need a place that would allow the public access to view what we have, as well as a place that people could donate any books, yearbooks, newspaper articles, and so on that would add to the present collection. We did have a room at the Historical Society for a brief period of time, but we were asked to vacate it as they needed the space for themselves. Um, another issue there was it's not handicapped accessible and our room was up on the second floor. Since then, the items have been stored first at Hooker School and we then moved them to Goodwin Library. We'll soon have to remove them from Goodwin Library. So all of this time, approximately two years now, uh, folks have not been able to have access or to see these items. Uh, during the 350th celebration of Hopkins Academy in 2014, the 350th committee had a souvenir store that was located in Town Hall. It was the first room on the left as you entered the building. This would be a perfect spot for us since it's located on the first floor and is also handicapped accessible. We would establish set days and hours for opening as well as leave contact information. As some of the town offices relocate to the Goodwin Library upon completion of renovation, we respectfully ask that you consider our request for space in town hall. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, um, I attended their meeting last week, I think it was. Yes, and, it was, David. Uh, I, I think it's something we should entertain and granted it's probably a year or so out by the time the Goodwin remodeling is finished. But um, I think the current park and rec office or something similar would be good to allow people to come in and take a look at yearbooks and, and things like that during business hours. So, and, and have access. Um, the only other option would be the library itself if there's room, but I, from my understanding, that's not something that the library wanted to uh, entertain at this time. Okay. So, I don't know what the thoughts are from the rest of the board. And but. I think if uh, renovations might take place at Goodwin, we don't really have anything uh, designated over at Goodwin, and that's handicap accessible coming up the ramp uh, for the first floor. Um, certainly, there might be some jiggling of rooms and things, and if they put the elevator in, that would certainly be uh, helpful to be accessible. And also, you know, let's see what happens with who moves over there from town hall. So I, I, I certainly think that it's um, a, a good idea to have this accessible to people. I like that idea. So whether it be in our own town hall right now or at the Goodwin, I think, you know, we could make that work for them. Thank you. Is Thank this you. anything that could be online instead of uh, in person? I mean, is it something where you could have an online store that then people just go to and... and Probably, put, in all honesty... The, I just don't know how many people would be going in and out of uh, something in town hall, you know? Um, in, in all honesty, that's nothing we have thought about, truthfully. Um, I think that uh, when we were at the um, Historical Society, there was a lot of interest and some of the materials, and, and if any of you would like to see them, we're certainly are willing to share. But there are things that date back almost 100 years now. Um, some of them, um, such as scorebooks, scorebooks from baseball games and basketball games um, with people's right. names, you know, that would be familiar, um, probably people's relatives. Um, to have that hands-on, uh, I think, is something that would appeal to people but I appreciate any consideration that you would give us. That would be wonderful, thank you. I do wanna add one more thing. Um, many of you are familiar with the lights at the gazebo uh -huh. and we will be doing that again. Uh, we will be lighting the tree that is in memory of Peter Weinzick. We'll be doing that the Saturday after Thanksgiving. Uh, certainly it's not gonna be the community affair that it has been for the last three years because we're not able to do that at this time. But that will be lit up, and we feel that that's going to sort of be a highlight driving down Route 9 for that period of time. We usually put, leave it on until the middle of January. So we just want to give you a heads up about that. Thank you. 
So that's going to be live streamed this year because of COVID, right? That's right. I forgot that, David. Thank you for mentioning it. Yes, uh, Hadley Media has volunteered to live stream it also. Yeah, I, I think we all need at this time of our lives a little light. And yes. <laughs> I think it would be great to have that on Route 9. I, I really think that would be a great thing. Thank you, Kathy. You're welcome. Thank you, people. Thank you for having me. Come again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We'll, we'll make sure that as soon as the remodeling is done, you have a home and hopefully it'll be a permanent home. So that way you don't have to keep moving uh, artifacts and articles. So that would be great. Really appreciate it. All right. Well, thank you, Kathy. Yep. All right. So then we're going to jump on to the next item, which is uh, North Lane. So the chief, chief can get out of here. And this conversation has been apparently going on for a long time. And uh, at one point, there was talk of making the road a dead end. There's been talk about one ways, speed bumps, on and on and on. As uh, most of you probably noticed today, uh, West Street was milled, uh, meaning the pavement was ground down and all of West Street will be repaved later this month. Um, so this kind of intensifies the conversation of how do we stop people from a, cutting through and putting wear and tear and maintenance uh, responsibility on the town when they should be staying on Route 9 and 47 and letting the state pay for it. Um, and also, how do we cut down on the massive amount of speeding that's happening down North Lane and West Street? Uh, there is a traffic study attached to this item, uh, this agenda item. And you'll notice that there's really basically five, 600 cars a day uh, cutting down North Lane. And I'm, I'm willing to bet that maybe 10 of those are actually residents that live on West Street or North Lane. So um, Chief, if you wanna jump in, feel free. But um, in my mind, I'd like to try a one-way eastbound temporarily for three or six month trial to see how that affects things. Um, and then we can always look at speed bumps later on uh, the issue with speed bumps is obviously they're permanent. We can't uh, put out the plastic temporary ones because of the, the they're pretty harsh on vehicles and they certainly won't last with snow plows. So, um, so Dave, David, I have, I have one thing on that. You want to yeah. go East. Um, I'm, I was looking to have no traffic turn left. We've had so many accidents at Echelon turning onto West street to go and go up northeast i thought it would be easier if we kept the flow of the traffic all one way um yeah. you said something about we had talked to dot or we put in a request to dot to no left hand turns on route nine period correct yep i, I spoke with their uh, district two rep and uh the, the guy actually attended umass and said boy that would have been nice when i was going to to and from umass every day and uh you know getting cut off by people making left-hand turns so he's on our side he did say it has to be reviewed by a traffic engineer which who knows how long that'll take yeah. uh i asked him about what about those sticks you know those things that stick up in the middle of the road to keep people from turning like they have up on route two and in 202 places like that and he yeah. said actually those are going away statewide because they're such a maintenance nightmare so he wow. said really your only options would be a concrete barrier in the middle which he said is extremely unlikely to go there and it, it would just detract from the, the common if we put that there or yeah. just simply no left hand turn signs and then that would be on the police department unfortunately to enforce those no left turns there cha-ching 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 yeah yes um, i did run by the fire chief, well, could we dead end cross path road and cut down, you know, everybody goes down North Lane, West Street cuts down Cemetery Road and then over to the bridge that way. He said that would be detrimental to ambulance response time and response time to Honeypot. So that's not an option. Uh -huh. So I had a, a different thought about uh, Cemetery Road and that is we had talked about making it one way eastbound with the exception of farm vehicles, which can go two ways. You can't go eastbound because you can't turn onto exactly. Exactly. So there will be no traffic coming onto it. And then if Newton Lane is eastbound, nobody's going to cut Newton. across. Not Newton. I, north. I'm sorry. North. North is eastbound. Nobody's going to cut across to take the back road, so to speak. 
And the issue was farmers won't like it, but we've just exempted farm equipment. Chief, is that a, is that a possibility? Uh, is that an enforcement nightmare? Uh, totally. Uh, yeah, I'll be, I'll be completely honest with you. It's an absolute enforcement nightmare, no matter how we slice it, unless you put speed tables in. Uh, speed tables are the only option that do not require, they won't require enforcement. And I understand it's, uh, it's not a great thing for our plows. Uh, the folks that we're looking to inconvenience are the speeders and they are going in both directions uh, on the roads and on that road and it slow them down going both directions. I know it's a costly uh, thing to do, but in 30 seconds, we just had six different ideas pop up on what roads we should adjust, which way they should be one way, whether we should exempt people or not. You know, what happens if a farm pickup truck is driving down the road the wrong way with farm plates? Do we allow them or do we only allow tractors? I mean, I don't want to go down the rabbit hole on, you know, all of these problems we're going to have. And the, the other issue is, is you know, even if you put speed tables in on North Lane, there's a possibility that you're just simply going to divert traffic onto uh, railroad. Uh, but the hope is, is that we push it back onto Route 9 where it belongs and they that way to get, like you said, David, these are, these are folks who are going through Hadley. They're not living in Hadley. And I just, my concern is that make it one way folks who are not just farmers but folks who are just trying to get to the dump uh or you know just do their daily stuff are going to have to rearrange um you know how they're driving and and we're going to be in our own our own town people um at the expense of you know the people who we want to inconvenience and anything except for speed tables is going to be an enforcement nightmare. We're going to have to have cops out there, I mean, all day, every day for months um, enforcing How much are speeding tickets? Can we uh, make some money for the town here? Well, yeah, but I mean, that's the, the idea is not to let them go down that road. So they're not going to be speeding on the road if we're turning them around and sending them some other direction. That's that's completely separate from the argument. So it's a tough one. Um, but what about, what about one if you look at cross path? If you look at cross path road, um, we, we argued with uh, mass DOT to adjust that intersection off of route nine uh, because it's been a no turn there for a decade or more. And we actually got them to put extra signage in. And then finally, the turn so it was even harder to make that turn and uh, we're still we still deal with issues with people yeah, they, they turn. still turn they block traffic and they still make the turn so yeah you know well you know like i said it's it's not an easy one and i apologize that um you have to make the decision but the the volume of cars honestly the, the, the speeds are are worrisome of cars that travel on that road is outrageous. Uh, I was, I was shocked by it. So yeah, those folks down is um, is is really the goal in both directions. Yeah. So, so Chris, uh, I I used to live on that road on Cemetery Road, and I live right around the corner from North Lane. So I just know that making that one way on Cemetery Road would be difficult because if you lived there. I mean, you're pretty close to West Street. I would violate that one way thing all the time because to get anywhere in Hadley, you'd have to go all the way around to major Route 9 traffic to then get back to Esalon or something like that. So um, that would be one problem. But I think the speed tables would be better. Just I, I feel like that's going to deter people over time. We're making it one way. I, I just am scared there's going to be people very confused about what's going on and there's going to be traffic turning around and all kinds of stuff. I mean, yeah. it's going to be confusing there, making it one yeah. way. So I'd be for trying the speed tables before directional only. If the speedway is going to be West Street, are we talking about speed bumps on that? Or are you only talking about Newton Lane? Uh, North Lane. North Lane, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I think realistically it's going to have to be North Lane because the, I, I don't think due to the historic nature of the common people want speed bumps or speed tables there. 
Um, and if we can realistically inconvenience people enough to not take the cut through there on North Lane, I think that'll also eliminate the West Street speeding problem at the same time. You know, I, I agree with you, David, 100%. And, and the other thing that I would just add to that um, is a lot of what we're seeing, especially, you know, speeding. The, the reason that we started this study is, is actually titled elementary school traffic study because the, you know, not only people speeding on that road, but they're going that way um, past the elementary school, past our kids. And they're humming when they're, when they're doing it. And they're going on Rocky Hill after that. And Rocky Hill is another hot spot where we get a lot of speeding complaints and we're trying to figure something out. The idea is there are certain algorithms with any of our map of the GPS mapping systems, Google Maps or any of the any of your um, your your Garmin GPS or whatever it is, that time will see that it's much slower to go that way than to simply take Route Nine. There is a possibility, and I certainly can't make this promise, but there is a possibility and a hope that the algorithms will change so much that eventually. Google Maps will stop telling people to go that way. Uh, and we could rem be able to remove them at some point. Down the road. I mean, I don't know how that works. I can't, I'm not a, a scientist in that area. I know people at Mass DOT we could ask, um, but, you know, that's a possibility. And that's kind of what we're trying to do is get all that traffic off of West Street, off of North Lane, off of Middle Street, off of Rocky Hill. Uh, even if you can take half of it, it's a win. What, Mike, how, how did you feel about no left-hand turn on Route 9? I don't know how you would do that. Uh, Mass DOT would have to approve it. Route 9 is a main thoroughfare. Um, right. you know, I, I spoke with the fire chief today about David's idea with those those um, flippy, those floppy yeah. guards there. Uh, yeah. I don't know how that would – I don't know that they would approve something like that. I don't, I don't know how it would work. Um, and essentially what it would be is if people wanted to turn there, you're, you're just forcing them into oncoming traffic. Uh, if they're still, if they still really want to turn there. Um, so, you know, like I said, I, I will, I will enforce this. However, the, the board uh, votes, I just feel like there's a lot of variables involved. Everybody has a, a, a different idea, different nuance in, in the way to do it. And the only one that's kind of, a simple solve all is the, the speed tables. And, you know, if you look at some of the comments that uh, David got on his uh, Facebook post, when he, when he asked for comments, a lot of our town residents are saying that they're driving down these roads at 25 miles an hour, just to irritate the speeders behind them. Uh, yeah. So the tables aren't going to bother our, our residents because they're going speed that you're going to be going over those things. So it, yeah. it ends. <laughs> so just so people know what speed tables are, basically if you look up an isosceles trapezoid, it's uh, that that is is what it is. Or just type speed table in Google. And so it has uh, sloped sides with a flat top on it. And it is they're quite a bit wider, larger than a speed bump. So they'll Hammer, still launch you through the air to hit it too fast, but they're a little bit nicer on vehicles and snow plows. Amherst uh, putting them in on all their side streets. Yeah, I was going to say, go to Amherst and take a left off of uh, Amity Street yeah. toward UMass, and you'll experience some speed tables. Yeah, Lincoln Avenue, all those small ones that go in between uh, Amity and Northampton Road, uh, have them all on it. I am yeah. absolutely for the speed bumps. Not for putting one-way traffic anywhere. The farmers are got to go around in, in six to eight months of farming season. They can't get their tractors in and out. They can't get their produce in and out. They're not going to be going around. We can't be putting the farmers out that far out and to go around. Uh, I know there's a, there's a farmer right on West Street, and I don't know if he's watching or not, but he'll probably see this. Rex has a hell of a time crossing Route 9, and we've been saying we needed a light on West Street for a long time. You know, he's coming from one side of West Street to the other to go down to his property down on uh, Honeypot. And it's just hard for them to get through with a tractor. A pickup is one thing, but, you know, they're all, that's all their farm equipment. John, I, I, I got cut off at, 
at the beginning there. Did you say you were for speed bumps or not? I, I missed that. I, I am for the speed bumps. I am not for any one-way streets in Hadley at all. All right. What about those, um, you know, North Street in Northampton by Sluzniaks and down that way? Uh, you can't go flying over those bumps that are on those roads. I'll tell you that right now. That's what we're talking about, Joyce. Just like yeah. that. Yeah, that, that. Same thing Amherst has. Yeah. I, I thought you were talking about, like, uh, the temporary ones they put up. Like, they. well, oh. I saw some up in Hampton Beach that, you know, they were metal. And they were no. on the on the side street. So this is real, actual uh, gravel, uh, coprobial uh, yep. pumps. Yep. These are all tar in place, and, and they're set. The plows can go over them without yeah. much trouble, and there there really ain't much to maintain them. Yeah, the I'm in, I'm in favor of those. I've seen those. I use that all in that way all the time in Northampton. Chief, you had something else. Just one more thing that I just wanted to, to caution the board about is, and as I mentioned, you know, I have my opinion on this. We'll enforce whichever direction you go. But if you go in the direction of speed bumps, speed tables, whatever you want to call them, you really need to consider setting some type of standard um, for when you're going to do this. Because I, we have, you know, every, you all know. We have speed problems on, on a bunch of different roads in town and we're doing speed studies in other areas. Um, you just need to kind of set a bar, the high watermark for where you're going to say it's okay to do this, where you're going to say we're going to try other measures first because we don't want speed. We also don't, like John said, he doesn't want any one-way streets anywhere in Hadley. We, we don't want speed bumps on 12 different streets in Hadley either. So, um if, if needed, Mike, if, you know, and you well, know. All I'm saying, you know, right, so all I'm saying is, is just kind of set a standard and, and d decide what, you know, where you're going to say yes and where you're going to say no is is all I'm just making a suggestion. Yeah, I, I, I know yeah. Rocky Hill has been a, a constant request for speed bumps there, but the, the problem is, is that gets into response time for vehicles because it is a main road to and from Amherst. And so having to slow down to go over, you know, 100 speed bumps down Rocky Hill. Uh, is detrimental. It's the same reason we can't dead end North Lane is because the, the fire chief says it's, it's too detrimental to response time. So, um, I, mean, I mean, I think we can make that argument to someone to say, why, why aren't you putting speed bumps on Rocky Hill? I, I think they need them. And I, Mike, you can chime in on it. I think they need them near the school. Um, you can start with Rocky Hill uh, coming towards the center of town and a couple of speed bumps that way, and then a couple going towards the school. You know, I think the police have a have a time controlling these people that are whipping along there in front of the school the school itself. Don't you? Well, yeah, we actually have an officer out in out there every morning when uh, the buses show up because because of the yeah out there. I I'm pretty sure that Mitch has uh, some studies that we've done in the past right in front. Oh. Of I can dig those up and, and uh, we can analyze them and, and send them off to you folks and see what you think. If we don't ha still have them in their in the computer system for the speed boards, we'll, we'll run it. Mike, have you, uh, have you surveyed uh, Northampton or Amherst um, as to when they put theirs in and what sort of uh, traffic count they had when, once they put them in? No, no, I haven't, John. I have, I just assume that their tra the traffic was, you know, fast enough and, and voluminous enough that, that they required them. I would be shocked to be quite honest with you if some of those, um, I, I think you'd be surprised at how close this tiny little road comes to collecting the same amount of traffic as some of those ones that they have in, in Amherst. Yeah. yeah. One in Northampton, but in Amherst, I think some of those streets, this would rival that as far as volume goes. Mm -hmm. All right. So could we, a motion, please, to uh, have the DPW investigate this further, and uh, if it's financially feasible to install um, speed tables on North Lane. Moved. Yeah. Yep. Second. All right. Any further discussion on speed tables? No, and I, I'd like Railroad Street too. Can we do one at a time? Joyce, Joyce, yeah. the stop signs up there now halfway, so. They uh they got to they got to stop and I see the cruiser's been sitting there. I don't know how many people yeah. they've actually caught at those stop signs not stopping. Yeah. They do they do blow through there, you know that. 
Yeah. Stop signs are nice though. Yeah. The, only is, <laughs> the only reason I say one at a time is because obviously money's tight this year. And yep, I, that's I, fine. Yeah. Let's do yeah. one at a time. We'll okay. see how it, and then you can actually see how the other street fares and we can do a count on that to see how if they cut first there and then skip North Street. You know what I mean? Yep. That's okay. probably I have, I have a question about Mike's comment about so somebody calls up and says, okay, you put speed bumps there. I want them in front of my house. What is going to be our requirement? I'm gonna uh, let the DPW decide that. And we're the traffic commissioners. So ultimately it comes before the select board to say yes or no. And it could be due to response times for emergency vehicles. It could be traffic flow. There's uh, the chief probably knows better than I do, but there, there's a variety of factors we could use to say yes or no. Yeah, I mean, it, it's going to be a combination of everyone, police chief, fire chief, ourselves, and DPW. Yes. And we'll, we'll also we'll also use, utilize the, uh, you know, data as well. You know, we can we can put the boards up and we can actually gather statistics and, and use all the factors you just named along with um, the data to, for you all to make that decision. Basically, basically, it seems like it's a ratio of the amount of traffic that's going down this road versus the amount of people that live there. And, you know, here a North Lane, it's like there's a specific amount of people that live on that road, yet we're getting route nine levels of traffic along that road. So there's yeah. something to the rationale that we're doing it where it's like, it's not really a major thoroughfare. We're redirecting traffic to the major thoroughfares that can handle that amount of traffic, given how many people live on the road. Correct. Actually, you're not even close. You said 500 cars going down that road right now. Between and four, four and 600 on an average day. All right. And that's in both directions? I believe so. And there, the last count on Route 9, I believe, was somewhere around 40,000 cars a day. So... That that's it's nowhere near Route Nine. So. Oh, don't forget, oh, we're, maybe Route Forty Seven. <laughs> yeah, but don't forget, we're in COVID right now. Not everybody is up and running and going to UMass or Amherst right now. Yeah, the, and and this survey was done. Remind me, Chief. I think it was August into September. August and September. Yeah. So. Yeah, and and one of the sides we one of the one of the directions we actually came out of uh readings because i thought this hearing was going to be much sooner so we we had it out there for like maybe a week and a half so one of them have a month's worth and the other one you only have you know maybe 14 days 15 days it's impressive i mean it's it's yeah. it may not be route nine numbers but it's it's impressive for that road Are, yeah mike is is that route nine number still fairly correct that forty thousand cars a day uh, the last i saw yeah between 40 and 50. okay uh, yeah, maybe not now, as Joyce mentioned. Maybe not now with COVID, but you know those numbers. Because and then they, they did those about studies. the holiday season. Yeah, they did those studies through phase one of Route Nine, through phase two of Route Nine, and I think the the last one was in preparation for the last phase of Route Nine. Yeah. Okay, uh, so we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion from the board? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, good enough. And uh, we're gonna move on to special town meeting warrant right now. Per uh, the request of the um, of Randy Iser, uh, we'd like to pare down this warrant as much as possible uh, due to COVID and also due to the fact that this is, uh, per the unified command, this is now going to be held at the fire, uh, the public safety station rather than in the school. So, um, it may be cold and it may be rainy. <laughs> so we can get about 60 ish people inside the emergency bays, uh, with the fire trucks out of there. So there will be some room for, um, you know, people to get out of the weather and be under the, he the heaters that are on the ceiling. But still, we want to make it as short as short and sweet as possible. So uh, let me pull up the warrant here. As soon as it opens, and uh, David Nixon or Carolyn, 
Can you talk a little bit about what our options are as far as removing some of the CPA items and what are the other options you're, you're uh, looking at removing from the warrant here? So David Nixon here. Um, uh, based upon the uh, reconfiguration of the budget, I think it's pretty safe to say that we don't need Article 7, the transfers to capital stabilization and general stabilization. So that one can be removed. Uh, the capital article, we can remove the $20,000 for the, um, uh, in Article 8, we can remove the $20,000 for the uh, the IT for the select board office. We uh, submitted a grant last week for IT through the community compact uh, grant program, and uh, I feel pretty confident that we'll get that. So. That'll cut down on one of the seven motions in that one article. Uh, I talked to Chris Okafor about the West Street Common CPA article number 13, and he agreed that we should pull it uh, and, uh, and line it up for the annual town meeting. And then uh, what about article 18? I think we're gonna pass on Russell School article 97. Uh, petitioning that to be removed for now. Okay. We can pull that one off. And then I'd also like to pull off uh, 14 for now as well, since that's gonna probably take a long time to talk about uh, on town meeting floor alone. And then uh, I, I would, I know this may be a little bit controversial, but the stretch energy code, I think that needs to stay on here to line us up for the green community's uh, funding potential. If we don't do this now, that's gonna push us off, you know, another year. Do we, do we need to open the warrant to do that? No. No. It is still open, I thought. No, I thought, I thought we closed it. Yeah, you can, but uh, you can, you can, it's your, it's your warrant at this point, so you can amend it however you wish. You're asking what Article 14 is, um, if someone could tell them, please. The Board of Health article. The Board of Health article. Yeah, I think if we just get whatever we need for uh, for the debt exclusions and for the budget, I think that will shorten the, the special town meeting up and, and get us in and out of there pretty quickly. The uh, CPA articles, is it possible to, um, I see Alan's here uh, from the cemetery committee. Is it possible to combine those three into one article just for time's sake? Is that a, is that a possibility? Be fine with me. I don't know whether it's, is, is it legally possible? David and Carolyn, is that a possibility? Yeah, we would need the CPA to uh, give its blessing for that. They're meeting on Monday, I think. Okay. Can, yes, that's correct. Can we make that, or Andy's here. So um, yeah, can we make that request of CPA um, just I, for time's sake? I'll be attending the meeting and uh, I'll bring it up. Okay, I great. think the, um, the CPA article about COVID renter relief, uh, that relief is vitally needed. And I think that one should remain if possible. So I'll talk to them about combining all of them into one article. You said about one? All, the, all the cemetery ones. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll ask them. I, I don't think the cemetery one's going to take that long anyway, even if they're done individually. Uh, I think people have been pretty supportive of the cemetery yeah. restorations. Yeah, exactly. I think that they're all going to pass fairly easily. All right. So which ones are we keeping for CPA? Are we getting rid of that pavilion thing? Or is yeah. that, what's the pavilion for? The town, yeah. uh, West Street? The common is off. Okay. Common is off. Is Turka Park? Is that on or off? The Turka Park. The wasn't there. I don't believe there was a Zaturka Park uh, CPA Zaturka article. Park is a, a funding deficit. We need to keep that on. Okay, that was the, that. I see that here. It's number fifteen, Zaturka Park. Which one are you on, Choice? Uh, it was Zaturka Park, unless I'm 
Oh no, I'm back. Hey, I'm at town. I'm at the Springtown meeting. Aren't I up to date here? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you already voted that down, Joyce. Relax. In your board docs. Oh yes. Well, okay. Keep going. I got it here somewhere. Okay. Hey, David, why don't you run us from the top here, just so we make sure we're all on the same page? Because we're going to need. So, article one is uh, uh, two twenty. Prior year bills for about $3,600. Article two is the general fund budget, and we're showing a decrease right now of $156,800. I need to work with Dan Zadonik to confirm that number. Uh, article three is the fund balance transfers. This is a housekeeping article. Um, number four is the revolving fund for the electronic permits for the building inspection department. Again, with that's housekeeping. Uh, number five is the account transfers for a cost overrun with the Zaturka Park for $1,410. Uh, number six is the modification of exemption of taxes for qualifying seniors uh, proposed by the assessors. Number seven is out. Number eight, capital budget, uh, 246825 There's no impact on taxes for any of that, by the way. All that borrowing is within the levy, not uh, not debt excluded. Okay. All right, article, yeah, nine, article nine is the first CPA uh, uh, article for 100,000 for the emergency rental relief for COVID-19. Uh, Articles 10, 11, and 12 are the three CPR, um, cemetery uh, um, projects. 13 has been withdrawn. 14 has been withdrawn. 15 and 16 are planning board uh, amendments to the zoning. And 17 is the stretch energy code. 18 is gone. The, the, uh, pl the planning board chair, Jim's here. Uh, Jim, are you is the planning board ready to move on 15 and 16 for this meeting? Yes, we are. Okay, so we'll keep those. Yeah, the, there'll be probably a small amendment for one of them, but it'll be a minor thing that won't affect anything. Can we do the consent, the housekeeping articles as a consent agenda? All at once? They are. I can set them up as consent. Okay. And that would save a little time. About 10 minutes. Yep. All right. So what does that what does that bring us down to? You have 14 articles at this point. Uh, if you combine uh, three three CPA into one, that's uh, uh, twelve articles. If we do the two consent, that's ten articles. Okay, and this sounds doable. Okay. All right. So, do we need to vote on? Is Randy here? I don't see Randy. Uh, do we need to vote on the location and time and date at this point? Yes, please. Okay. So I'll, make, I'll make a motion to accept uh, the fire station as uh, approved by our emergency manager, uh, Chief Spank and Abel, to have town meeting there inside and out. Which, which, which station? At the fire station in the main, the main station. And huh? uh, main station main station and it, it'll be november 14th at 1 p.m 1 p.m on a saturday correct okay so we have a motion can i get a second 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 from christian any further discussion on location time and date now let's just advertise yeah i'd still like to take that the rest of that capital off even though it's uh, no no effect on taxes. We're going to need every penny we can right now. We have 
I guess our last chance to make that that change will be next week by next week's meeting. So we can we can certainly talk about that. Or, or even on the floor, we could pass over it. I mean, if it comes down to that. Yeah, let's look. Let's look at it, John C. Can I have a minute to do that? Till next week. Oh yeah, we can late till next week. Okay. Sure, guys. Just make sure you're reading the right one. I got it right in front of me now. I'm all set, John. Yeah, and, and there was some stuff there on capital that is needed. I know, like, for the fire department, the um, extrication airbags. Yeah. Uh, that's something that was on last year that didn't pass, So, and something yeah. they need replacement for. And then a couple of things are, like, standard things we've been doing all along, which should be more routine. So I'm hoping we can keep at least the majority of those on if possible. Yeah, that's why I want to take a chance to look at it and make sure that we're not missing something that we should. Thank you. Um, all right, so we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. And just as an update, the um, it looks like we're still working on the tax rate. And this is a work in progress, so no promises, but I do want to say thank you to uh, Dr. McKenzie and the school committee for giving back 375000 in unused funds uh, from their school committee last meeting last week. Um, it's, it's a big help toward uh, either keeping people's tax bills the same or less, which is what we're trying to do throughout this year, even with the, the change in you know, meals tax and hotels taxes and things like that. So I'll just give this preliminary number uh, right now, our tax rate is 1264, and we're looking at a possibility of it dropping to 1212 for next year. Uh, the bad news is the values of everybody's houses went up by something like 6% last year, if, if I'm quoting this right. I see uh, Dan's here. But um, it, so we need to find some money in order to have people pay the same bill. Even though the rates dropped, the values went up. So that's what we're working with here. Well, I don't have a mansion, so mine's not going up. <laughs> that's what you think. <laughs> wait till you get your bill. I know. We'll wait. Thank you. <laughs> all right. So we're all set with that. Let's. Uh... <laughs> all right. Uh... All right, so we'll go back to public comments. Um, we I'm, have... I'm sorry, there's a public hearing that started at seven o'clock. Oh, so what we'll do that, and then we'll come back to public comments. And <laughs> is the person here for the public hearing? Um, Christy Bowden is the attorney for um, the Mullen Center. Christy, are you here? Um, she told me that she would be attending the meeting this evening. Christy? Okay. Um, so I don't believe she's here. Um, Does she need to be? I would. I was really hoping that she would explain this to y'all, but um, I will. I will lead it my best, and then y'all can make a decision from there. Or you can, I guess, continue the hearing and we'll see if she had problems getting on or something. Um, the Mullen Center has requested that you do an alteration to their premises license. It's uh, top of the campus holds the liquor license at the Mullen Center. And the liquor license has always been for the Massachusetts room and the green room and the storage rooms behind the green room. And then the rest of the Mullen Center, they have always pulled one day liquor licenses um, for every event. Um, the ABCC has recommended to top of the campus that they get a catering license, use the catering license for the two rooms, and then have their liquor license to be for the rest of the Mullen Center. Um, and so that is what they're coming to you for. Um, and I'm sorry that they're not here to discuss it further. Oh, is this Kristen, is that you? Kristen, Christy? Hello? 
Okay, I'm going to mute them because I don't think that's her. So that that is what they're asking for. They're asking to flip their liquor license to the rest of the Mullen Center. Um, and the ABCC has approved their catering license. So their catering license would be for the Massachusetts room and the green room. So are we going to take a hit on license fees since they're going to have a, instead of one, a lot of one day? So they're a tax exempt organization and their one day licenses are $20 to $35 a, a license. Um, I will say that doing the licenses takes me a lot of time. Um, but I, I issue them probably dozens of licenses to that, to that location every year, but they already have an all alcohol license that they're going to continue with. I don't really see it having a, a, a very large impact they still have McGurk Stadium where they pull one days and um, the Basketball Champion Center. So we're still going to have one days from them. It just won't be as many. I think I think given the situation of where uh, their athletic program is uh, not stable at this point, um, as is many other colleges and whatnot, I think, uh, you know, these are just some of the things that we have to uh, except at this point, but I hopefully next year uh, things will pick up and they'll be different. So that's what we can always hope for. Um, they've been good to us with their one day licenses. I don't see that this is going to present a problem. So I would make a motion to accept this. I can second. I'll second it. So motion by Joyce, second by Christian. Any further discussion on this? All right. All those in favor. Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Sorry to interrupt David like that, but when you advertise it, you got to be precise. Yep. No, I appreciate it. I missed that. So, all right. So we'll go back to public comments now and uh, just go over the quick little ground rules. Uh, we're allowing 15 minutes and three minutes to, per person. So if you'd like to make a public comment, wave, make yourself known. Shell Horowitz, go ahead. Thank you, Chairman Phil. I want to say thank you to the board for shortening the warrant agenda for town meeting, for listening to the concerns of many people in town who were concerned that those most affected by certain decisions would be the ones most likely to stay home because of COVID in the current situation. Um, so I really appreciate that Article 14 is not just showing up on the fall warrant. But I would also suggest for the future that it would be a courtesy to the considerable number of us that showed up to this for the public hearing, sorry, for the public comment, to let people know. I mean, it is now, it, we started the public comment an hour and seven minutes after it was posted to be started. And I think it would be very nice, sorry, no, 97 minutes, an hour and a half plus. Uh, it would be nice to have known that going in that we weren't going to be on the agenda for more than an hour and a half. I think, Shell, with, with all of the things that we had had a, um, uh, things that we wanted to clear the air because we knew of concerns of people that wanted to make comments, but I think you needed to know ahead of time uh, of what we were planning or what we had thought we should do with the town meeting warrant. Um, so that would have made a difference in people's comments and things of that nature. Yes. Uh, those things had to get done first uh, before we took comments, because I think it was fair to them to hear uh, our comments about changing the town meeting and making things a little bit more expeditious uh, for that meeting. So uh, yeah. sorry yeah. that it was an inconvenience for people, but I think uh, it served everybody mm -hmm. better that they heard what was going on instead of you know, airing all of their concerns ahead of time before knowing what we were actually yeah. going to do. I agree, Joyce. I just think that you could have said at the beginning of the meeting, public comment will be near the end and uh, tune back in um, at um, 6.30 to hear a relevant discussion that you'll want to hear before the public comment. And then we would have all known that and been able yeah. to act accordingly. Yes, take it, your, your thoughts taken well, thank you. Anybody else? 
Um, yeah, I have a quick uh, thank you for people who voluntarily withdrew their warrant articles. You know, everything in town meeting is important, but public health has to uh, trump everything, if I can coin a phrase. Um, so thank you very much for everybody being flexible, and we'll see you there. All right. Thanks, Andy. Anybody else? Michelle? Uh, hang on one second. Let's get you unmuted. There we go. I, I do have a concern about um, town meeting being held at the public safety complex with 60 people. I don't know if that's 60 people six feet apart. Um, I know that town meetings are being allowed to be held with um, a, roughly half of a normal quorum because of COVID. At the same time, it's um, a much smaller number than usually appears a town meeting. So I have concerns about the small number of people, and I, for one, would be willing to stand outdoors in the rain, in the cold, and have possibly more people come. I also have a lot of concerns about any indoor meeting because indoor air is the issue um, with COVID. I mean, it, um, in in indoor air is the major risk factor for COVID. And um, I think it's a tough thing to ask people to do, to choose between their health and possibly their life and their involvement with the town that they care deeply about. Yeah, uh, Michelle, I, I should have been more clear. Um, it, it's going to be, although it's going to be in the, partially in the equipment base, uh, there's also going to be most of the seating outside. Really, we're just using the equipment area for those that need the benefit of the heaters that are in the ceiling there. The garage door bays, from my understanding, will be open. Um, so it's basically going to be open on two of the four sides, uh, just kind of like some of the outdoor restaurant seating areas. And according to the fire chief, when those bay doors are open, it's basically a wind tunnel. So for all intents and purposes, even the people that are in there, although they'll be under the, the heaters, they will be out, outside or as, as close to as possible. So, and, and we're not gonna limit to 65 people. We'll still have plenty of seating for you know, 150, 200 people that wanna show up. It's just some people will have to sit outside versus under the heaters. Yeah, we're still staying well, the number of 100, correct? Correct. We, we need 100, yes. Mm -hmm. And I, think, okay. and I think we should sit outside. I don't okay. care where I sit. I'll sit outside. Don't bother me at all. Okay. Um, are, are we going to have a mask policy? And do we have a way of dealing with people who refuse to wear masks, who don't have a medical condition that makes it difficult to wear a mask? Everybody has to wear a mask. This is, this is the policy. Board of Health, CDC, whatever. If you're going to go to the meeting, you wear a mask. If you're going to sit anywhere within anywhere, even of six feet of people with whatever, everybody has a mask unless they have a medical condition. And then we will try to make accommodations for those people. And I'm sure Mike has already thought about those things. Yeah, the, the fire chief has... Um... We'll put out more details next week, but he's working on a plan. He had, he had a whole like a um, quarantine room set up for those that refused to wear masks when we were going to do it inside so they could be in the cafeteria versus people that would, you know, wear masks in the gym. So I'm sure he'll come up with some solution that'll be uh, great for everybody. And I think uh, Dr. Moser's here. Did you want to chime in at all on the um, health aspect of the, the meeting that we talked about today? Right. Yeah, the um, the sheltered seating, uh, there will be, uh, you know, di social distancing, masks will be required. Um, and, you know, again, there there is inherent risk uh, in any gathering. So uh, the Board of Health uh, strongly supports the vote that just happened to uh, to uh, shorten the agenda. And, uh, you know, we would suggest just have as many people as needed for a quorum, get the necessary business done, and uh, hopefully we'll be better positioned in the spring. We'll see. Um, can I add, Susan, that one of the things that we do at my place of employment, which is uh, Cooley Dick CMG uh, Orthopedics, is that 
anybody that has concerns, uh, we are have we as professionals have to wear uh, eye protectant. Um, that is one of the things that they suggest. So if anybody wants to wear a face shield, that's more than thought of to cover the eyes or whatever. Um, they could also do that if they felt more comfortable uh, in doing that coming to the meeting. Do you, under, do you know what I mean? Yeah, you mean a mask and a face shield. Uh, yes, if yeah, it, or, okay. or, or glass, glass protectant. Uh, some I wear, if people felt like they wanted to do that, they could also do that. They could. Uh, Michelle, I did I cut you off or did you have more, Michelle? No, that was good. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And then uh, Kenneth Talon Everybody's has been raised as well. Kenneth? Hey. There we thank go. you. Sure. So this is the first uh, select board that I've sat in on, and I'm uh, very appreciative of the thoughtfulness that everybody approaches to different problems. I was very impressed. Uh, and to clarify something for myself, the discussion of how the Board of Health will be um, addressed in terms of either elected or chosen, that issue has been put off till a time of a larger meeting later. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. And don't be a stranger to our meeting, sir. I'll come back. It's very That's interesting. Fun. Very interesting. I think they're great. <laughs> All right, uh, who else had a hand up? Uh, Lynn Bowmaster? Yeah, um, I'm glad <laughs> to hear that that decision was made about taking the um, warrant off for the time being and considering it later, whatever the steps are going to take. And it sounds like a pretty good um, arrangement for the town meeting. I, we came into it late. So my question is just, is there, how many people will conceivably be <laughs> inside together? Like what's the limit on that? So the chief said that it was, I believe 65 was what they could fit in there socially distanced inside the bays and everybody else would have to be outside the bays and in seats outside. Uh-huh. And then there's there, the bays are open. Is there any airflow like on the other side of it? Yeah. Uh, his description was when the doors are open, it basically creates a wind tunnel. So there's constant air. Oh, flow. wind tunnel. I didn't hear. Uh-huh. Yeah. Got it. All right, sounds, sounds like a good plan. He said when they need to clean out the garage, they just open the doors and the wind blows it out for them. Yeah. Into the neighbor's yard, so. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's two doors on the west side of the building and there's three doors on the east side of the building and the west wind comes through there and it, it just, it, it's fresh air all the time when you have the doors open throughout the summer. That's a key thing, thank you. Um, uh, anybody else for comments? Uh, there's no name on your photo, but uh, the lady uh, with I'm Margaret. Sorry. There we go. Yeah, it should uh, have uh, said Margaret Mastrangelo. Thank you. This is my first town meeting as well. And I really, um, I'm just glad that the decision of regarding the Board of Health, whether it's appointed or elected, has been postponed because I think this, you know, is, is too big of an issue to. Um, to try to deal with tonight. And so um, yeah, I'm glad that, uh, you know, we'll have more time to discuss this more fully. And I'm um, at this point happy that um, Dr. Mosler is continuing, you know, her good work. And, um, and I think that the plan as someone else said about keeping those bay, window, uh, those bay doors open is, is great because it certainly makes me feel safer um, to come to one of the meetings. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Okay. I think that's it. Jennifer, did I miss anybody? Okay. I don't, I don't believe so. Sorry. I muted myself. Okay. Okay, so we'll keep moving on here. Um, 
Good. Good. Well, Mrs. Molecular's on um, the email about the UMass uh, person, uh, point person. We're, we have that on for, for next week because we okay. need a little bit more details. But I, I okay. promise her that we'll, uh, we'll invite her back next week to talk all she wants all right. about. Uh, well, the, the I mean, it's, it, just make sure that someone from, from our board or someone contacts UMass and see, see what the deal is to get someone put on it. Yep. Okay. All right, moving down the line here. Uh, Russell School solicitation of letters of interest. Uh, the select board will discuss issuing, issuing a solicitation of letters of interest from prospective developers for the Russell School. And so there is a example solicitation here attached. Uh, Carolyn, do you wanna talk a little bit about this? Sure, um, this, was, this was a document that uh, David and Alan worked on and uh, is basically a letter of interest uh, reuse for that building, anything from housing to, uh, it kind of just threw out a few ideas, but the intent of the letter of interest is to find out what some creative letters of interest would come back to, to us. With that, we would produce a request for proposal using the framework of some of those letters of interest to see what was out there. So this we'd like to do, I would suggest thinking about having a due date for, I think December 4th would be the first week in December. That would give us enough time to review the letters and put a proposal together and have it ready for annual town meeting. So would this be posted in the paper or in the MMA magazine or where are we, where are we putting this? I, I think it's, we were talking, I know Jennifer, we were talking about that. Um, I know there's a list, but there we would be, you know, sending it out to as many resources that obviously the history here with David and Jennifer and others would have that I would utilize to get that out. I, I did have one question about the letter. Um, and I'm not sure if they would be. I have a little problem with that, that a letter of interest uh, for outside concerns, which would make them not have to follow the uh, guidelines of, that we have for um, paying uh, prevailing wages. Um, so anybody that would take over that building, they would have a better um, number to deal with to do it where we're looking at 30 million, theirs would be less. How would they be in line for any communi uh, community preservation funds uh, being an outside concern, how would that happen? I'm not. I wasn't sure on that. Well, the letters of interest, and in, in, um, if, if uh, David wants to bring in some of his history and knowledge into that aspect of it, but the letter of interest isn't committing anybody to that project. It's 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 gaining interest of someone who thinks they might meet the criteria. Um, Alan, David, I don't know if you want to add anything else that can answer joints better yeah we're just just trying to be transparent if the developer was relying upon the community to provide a lot of uh, dollars through cpa then that portion of the work would be subject to prevailing wage so we just want to put people on notice that if we're if you're looking for public money as a as a in a partnership um the, the mm -hmm. kind of price um, we're not saying that that's actually going to happen. It all depends on the exact um, uh, configuration of the project, which we don't know at this point, but we're just give, giving everybody fair warning. But uh, uh, just bear with me, David, and, and set me straight here that somebody from um, outside of the town not being in, they wouldn't have access to our community preservation funds. Correct? No, they would. Why would they? I'm, I'm asking David Allen, not you. Sorry. You have you have set a precedent by giving uh, CPA money to an outfit in Northampton. By by being the um, courthouse. Uh, not the courthouse. Uh, the uh, Oliver Smith will. Okay. And North Adley Dam. 
friends, friends of Lake Warner, right? Yeah. Friends of Lake Warner. Okay. I just, I just need the clarification on that. Thank you. Okay. So, um, I, if, I, if I could just add one thing, there's no guarantee they'll get the CPA money either. They have to go through the CPA committee and the town meeting. And town meeting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. I appreciate that comment. I, I'm really concerned about fast tracking this in this day and age with what we're dealing with here. I'd like to see this out for uh, probably a minimum of four or five months to see where where and when if if the economy goes one way or the other here and if this covid goes away i'm going to start calling you the chief can kicker here that kicks it down the road <laughs> we've got a road for a lot of years now what's another six months you know at this point the problem is the roof needs repair there's there's just more and more things as we sit and wait so we need to we need to keep moving here in the process and if we don't get anything, then we can reevaluate. But to stab it out there for five or six months, I mean, we, we got to make a decision here. Otherwise, we're going to be into this for even more money. We, we got to mothball it. We got to do something. So we're just looking for letters of interest. We're not looking for proposals or anything along those lines. So this could be anybody making any kind of interest in it. It's not set in stone. We're not putting anything out to bid. It's just letters of interest. I think doing this, having a what is it? Eight week turnaround, something like that. That's plenty of time for this type of thing that we're doing. I think it also offers us other perspectives that we may not have thought of of use of the building. Yeah, right. that's that's what I'm saying. You know, if we got a little longer period of time and we got more ideas in. Maybe there's something out there that we haven't thought of. You know, right. exactly. It, the, the only thing that's going to cost the town is the postage for the letter. Yeah. All right, so could I get a motion to approve uh, the, this solicitation of letters of interest? Yeah, I can make a motion to uh, send out this letter, this request for letters of interest. And I I'll guess I, can stop there. I don't know if we want a certain date to put a date on it. Um, you said December 4th, but it said December 16th in the letter. I don't know if you prefer one over the other. Uh, what day is the 16th? Uh, that is a Wednesday. Is that okay? Yeah. Carolyn? Okay. Sure. Cool. Let's, well, let's stick with the 16th and give a little extra time. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll second that motion. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> John sounds excited about that one. All right. Um, let's see, going down the list here, let's, uh, let's actually jump to, cause I know Tommy probably wants to get out of here. Uh, we're going to pass over the cleaning services award tonight. Uh, we've got some more work to do on that, but let's talk about uh, the building inspector project report. Tommy, you ready to do that? Yes, sir. Yeah. How's everybody doing? Good. Good. Great. Good. Uh, thank you for giving me a report on the, uh, building department. Um, I'm about two weeks short of uh, my six months since I was hired full time. Um, we've been working on the um, online, which a little impatient. Uh, we were supposed to be online. The last promise was the first half of September. So I did get on our salesman um, and we're actually scheduled now for training for everybody on the uh, week of the November 9th. So that should be next two, three weeks. Um, an update on where we stand uh, financially or, or uh, revenue wise, comparing from 19 to today, we're last year we we're at 305 permits, $87,005. Um, this year we're at 316 permits, 112, 326. So we've actually up 11 more permits and over 25,000 at this point. Um, and a little update on our uh, project uh, coordinating meeting we have every Tuesday at 1.30, which is very beneficial for myself as well as, you know, the other departments that um, join it. I don't know if you want me to discuss some of the ones from the last, um, I believe Jennifer attached Tuesday's um, agenda. If you want me to just discuss a few of them or people had questions on them. 
I, I would just kind of summarize what it is that, you know, we do in, in, in this meeting. I mean, if someone, if an issue pops up, uh, wh why is this, you know, let people know that, that this is, and I'll say it's kind of like a, uh, a round table troubleshooting uh, session for enforcement inspections, you know, things like that. Planning board bills usually there. Um, so it's a chance for everybody to be at the same table over zoom and, and deal with these issues. So talk, talk a little bit about that. Explain why it's helpful. Sure. Um, it's, it's very helpful. Like I said, more so for me than anybody else, but, um, anybody has anything we add to it or there's a discussion at the end and we seem to be able to, we have to leave a lot on, even though it's ongoing, um, and being very busy with all the permits and all, but you know, everybody can have their, put their input to help each other out on it. Um, some things like, uh, number six river drive, the issue came up about the dumpster and the trucks in the way. So we're, I was able to go out and then, you know, by the end of the week, that's supposed to be moved for the right of way. Um, a big thing is the Connecticut river issue. And that I wanted to bring up as far as the board is asking permission. Um, I've been on, on committees in that to help in other communities, but as far as setting a committee up to work on the bylaw. So what, what I was going to propose, whether this is how it works, is to get, you know, somebody from ZBA, planning, fire chief, a few of the residents that, have, you know, butt the river and come up as far as working on a new bylaw, which, um, you know, ZBA agrees we need to, planning and all, we need to do something to make it so it's feasible or totally, you know, stop all these trailers along the river. I think you need to add in there, Tommy, CONCOM. Yes, yes, conservation. Because um, they seem to be barking up the wrong tree lately. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so they I'd, actually... like them, I'd like them in on that because they need to be directed towards uh, what's going on along the riverbanks. That seems to be uh, something that we need to look at, um, and they should be a part of that. Definitely. I also had Board of Health. I just didn't read my notes here. Board of okay. Health for sure would, would be on it as well. And anybody okay. else that you could think of or, um, you know, in the email that would, would volunteer to work with it. Yeah. Is, this, is this something that you would want, um, you know, people to volunteer or is it, could I get a list asking the departments and boards um, as well as, you know, some of the people that have a big interest along the river? What's the best way about going about it? I think uh, advertising on Channel 5 and certainly asking each board that you feel should be on your committee, uh, asking them for a representative. Okay. All right. And, and see who volunteers to do that. I think that's important. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. The citizens that own property along the river. Yep. If you don't want, if you don't want to approach some of them, I will volunteer to approach them. Yep. We've but actually not, had you don't have to have everybody, John. You need to have a few Hadley mm -hmm. residents that have property along I know. The, the river. So you need to have, you know, you need you don't need everybody. You need a few people. Well, you're going to affect a lot of people through Hadley on the Connecticut River. Well, so, that's uh, and that's what we should do. I mean, we have to do for sanitation and everything else along the river. I mean, DEP gets on us for all these other things, and I think DEP would be involved with anything being discharged into the Connecticut river. Wouldn't you? Yeah. 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 But I still want the input from the property owners. I, I absolutely agree with you. And I think that there couldn't be some resolution um, and some type of bylaw put into place that everybody's happy with. So, Tommy, why don't we reach out to the committees or the different boards in town and get them to give us a, a list of who they want to send to this committee and then we can advertise on channel five for volunteers. And then, uh, you know, maybe we get a few of the property owners along the river that want to participate. Maybe we don't, but then, um, you know, at least they have a chance to, to speak up and, and join the process if they want to. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, I, had I, one just, other, oh, ahead, I had one other question for you about the project that's being done at Hopkins Academy. Who, who actually is monitoring that Tom? Uh, with gravel and dirt being taken out of there, who's 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 got their eyeball on that? Um, I'm, I'm assuming I don't know if Chris is still on that DPW. They did reach out to me as far as taking the loam, and that's why I had brought it up. 
um, I don't know if it was a few meetings ago when, when it was that they wanted to, you know, haul some of it to us to an on-site as opposed to leaving it, you know, which would have been in town, but at that point we wouldn't have known where it went to. And, you know, I reached out to the um, engineer and they said that it's in the contract that they had to haul it to our, you know, DPW. So it all stayed, you know, to use for the town. Okay. Uh, they haul they hauled it to the yard for uh, three days, Joyce. So the, the <clears throat> all alone is, is, is in our yard. Okay. Right, right next to the elementary school pile. It was a okay. couple of yards, right, John? Yeah, I think it was 200 and something, Tommy. Yeah, they were estimating like 400 and they wanted two and two. I, I don't recall exactly, but it was definitely over 200 yards. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to double track because uh, when I was on the building school committee, uh, when we built the elementary school, um, there was much disruption and controversy about where did that uh, – loam go that was on that property and uh the opm on that project didn't actually know where the where that went so you know uh nobody kept track of it so i just wanted to make sure that we're all on board where whatever is going on down there i didn't know actually who was in charge of monitoring that project because it's a school project um so i just wanted to be sure that somewhere where it, it's a floodplain uh, I would think that CONCOM would be in on that because it is a floodplain um, and, and loam taken out of there that makes it more accessible if there was a flood. So am I wrong on that, Tom? No, no. And uh, like I said, I, it's not permitted or anything like that. So when they reached out to me about taking the loam, uh, the engineer was very cooperative to, you know, to pull the contract and review it with me. So, okay. but no, that would be something that, you know, DPW conservation, we all probably should in the future have a, have some type of input to keep an eye on things. Yeah. Do you know if CONCOM was involved with any of this with being at a floodplain? I don't believe so, but I can't, you know, not a hundred percent sure. Okay. So that's a question for us to reach out to them they and probably ask probably had to approve all of the uh, sub drain and everything they put in there. So they had to have known, known what was going on. Yeah, I just I just would like an answer to that if CONCOM was involved with that or not. We're talking about the Hopkins Academy athletic fields. Yes, David. Thank you. They do. They do have a permit from uh, uh, CONCOM. OK, I just wanted to know if anybody was monitoring that from CONCOM. I can check in with Janice. That would be great. Thank you. Uh, I'll actually add it on the list for next week. So all right. Then. Thanks, Tom. I appreciate that. Yep. Thank you. Bill, did you, did you want to jump in and say anything about the weekly meetings as far as have they been helpful for planning issues or anything like that or any issues you see? Yeah, originally, when uh, we started, it was a little over a year ago, and it was basically because of some lack of communication with departments and things like that, especially when it was big projects. So that's when we started forming, you know, and having these meetings, which have helped tremendously. Um, and then of course the river this year, we, we've been trying to work on it, but it's trying to get all of the boards together um, to let us know what it is that they're all looking for in each part of their parte in the, in the river. Um, so, that's basically what we're trying to um, work on now is to get everybody's input from um, as far as planning, ZBA, conservation, board of health, um, our department, fire, police, anybody's input. And our plan is to, as we were talking about forming a committee, is to eventually um, send out then a, a letter you know everybody come together send out a letter to actually the property owners so they're aware because of what we're finding especially because of covid a lot of people property owners are just letting people put trailers and stuff on their on their own property um this way if we get in contact with the property owners um it, it will help a little bit especially getting these trailers permitted so that's you know one thing that we're trying to work on. Um, so we're hoping by next year that we're gonna 
get this a little bit more under control. And, um, you know, so that's the one, main, one of our main goals is, is trying to work on that river. That's been an issue for eons, eons. Yeah. <laughs> You're well, not gonna our, solve it overnight, but we're gonna try and help you do that. Exactly, you. And, our, and our main issue is because of FEMA. And I think that's the problem. A lot of the property owners don't realize how, you know, FEMA, you know, DP, a lot of that is part of it. And people are putting in docks without, you know, getting the proper permits and, and things like that. And that's why we want to form together this letter that will kind of let the property owners know what it is that each department is kind of looking for. We do have a couple actual um, property owners that are very interested in once we form a committee to kind of help us out and to reach out to the people that they also know. Um, that are out there. So I, I think that will help tremendously too. You know, you got so much to look at and we're never trying to tell people what to do with their property. So, but we are trying to regulate them on DEP, CONCOM, everything else that abuts the river that's, you know, environmental, um, which we have to be aware of in the town. So in setting up that, yeah, if that's your property, you want to put a trailer down there, fine, but not, not five or six trailers of all your friends and neighbors and whatever. So I think in, in looking at that, I think they have to be reasonable also. But, you know, I think we're at, at a good start where we have to, you know, do something of this nature because of the COVID and people taking to staying um, the sales of campers and everything else this year has been up. Mm -hmm. astronomically and people are just taking that and deciding that well i'll just stay along the river and that'll be my vacation for the year so you know us helping you out with that we're more than happy to do that yeah and like i said that's where the the police and every well like uh mitch's uh island um that yeah. has been great with that cleaning up but one of the concerns and we were getting a lot of calls on where people that do have houses right along the river too. Um, they were having a lot of concerns of the jet skis and the boaters being out of control and mm -hmm. the river just getting very congested. And yeah. so um, that's when we started really saying we, we really, really need to do something about this. So in an essence, uh, we don't have control over the waterways. Right. But, but your, um, Marine, uh, I'm trying to think the Coast Guard uh, oh, of the of their they're the ones that monitor that. And actually, in years past, when we used to put our boat in the river, they used to be down there to make sure that you had the life preservers and all of that and safety on your boats before you put them into the water. I'm not sure where they're at right now, but maybe they're still doing the same thing. Um, but it has become more of an issue, I'm sure, with the amount of people um, that are doing boatings and things like that during the summer. So, you know. Right. And that's why we're trying to push the permitting uh, back, you know, so they go in front of the ZBA like they should be. So this way, as uh, the fire chief, Mike Spank Spanknable said, we need to know names of people who are actually own the trailers um, and get their consent because if they're not there and we get a flood, you know, mm -hmm. things, they're starting to use big propane tanks. There's just a lot of big concerns that we're starting to get. Yeah. And um, we're yeah. trying to hopefully get control of it real quick. Yeah. It's for their, it's for their own safety. If anything else, you right. know, that's what it's all about. So. Yep. Mr. Dwyer, did you have anything to chime in on the meetings or? Just well, here. I have been on the development team meetings for, uh, you know, however long they've been going on. And, um, you know, the river is an issue. Uh, the placement of campers on the issue, uh, on the river is an issue. Uh, we have uh, a proposed bylaw from one of the state alphabet agencies that we we may be looking at for the Springtown meeting. 
And um, yeah, we do have to get a handle on this. Northampton does not allow campers or trailers on the in the floodplain at all. Hatfield does not. So we have uh, some spillover from there. And we have people from as far south as Agawam who are camping here. Yep. And it will potentially affect our uh, flood insurance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else on that that anyone would like to add? Well, All right. I just have one thing to say that Bill has been great when he's at our meetings because he's a fountain of information. <laughs> All right. Uh, before we go on to library, fire station, and senior center updates, I just wanted to give um, Molly sent over an update, Molly Keegan, um, regarding the, the Campus Coalition, CCC, I don't know what it really stands for, but uh, just some of the highlights. Um, so there's been a lot of concern about what's happening with parties and, and students and, and whatnot. So Amherst Police Department, they're down 700 service calls this semester compared to the last uh, last year, the same, the same semester last year. Noise complaints are up slightly, uh, but that's due to revisions of the town bylaw uh, requiring more stringent enforcement. There's been no open container violations, uh, four cases of minors in possession of alcohol for OUIs or DUIs as people refer to them. Uh, eight compared to 14 last year. Um, let's see, no negative impacts seen from marijuana dispensaries. Uh, mass compliance has been overall excellent with students. Um, most of the COVID hotline calls that they've been receiving are due to quote unquote perception accusations, meaning that people are claiming there's large, large gatherings in violation of the governor's orders, but in, in effect, they are actually meeting the requirements of the governor's orders. Uh, Amherst Fire Department calls are down 35%, calls to UMass down 78%. Um, the town only calls are down about 23%. Uh, UMass Police Department, very quiet on campus, no alcohol violations to date. Um, the most concerning thing they've been dealing with is uh, some disturbing Zoom bombings from people uh, messing around with Zoom meetings for the students, but I guess no surprise there. Hadley and Sunderland, uh, minimal activity to report. Uh, Off-campus life, uh, they're focusing on education for Halloween, doing lots of outreach uh, this weekend. Seven of the... Go ahead. Someone have to Oh, okay. Uh, seven of the 11 Greek life houses are open. Uh, one just announced that it was uh, closing permanently. Um, early relationship building has worked out. Um, let's see, building inspector, some reports of disabled smoke detectors, uh, calls from parents about spring off-campus housing. Let's see, on and on. Um, so overall, not too bad. Uh, granted, there's been a whole bunch of cases over there, but for the most part, the students are behaving themselves. And uh, most of the the claims and the, the complaints that I know I've been hearing about massive parties in town and Amherst and Hadley and, and whatnot apparently aren't as massive as people are making them out to be. So they, they seem to be making meeting the governor's requirements. They may, may not be smart, but they are, for the most part, legal. So that's that's where we are from the UMass update. So actually the, actually the numbers are down. They were high when they first started. Um, but actually the case is coming in at this point, the number remains the same, uh, but the amount of people testing uh, negative are, are more than what they used to be. That's good. And we are still unshaded on the map, Hadley is at least. So we're trying to keep it that way. Um, all right, so let's move on to uh, let's do a senior center update. Jane, what do you, anything from the senior center? Uh, this is senior center and not my liaison report about the senior center or both. You can combine them if you'd like. Okay. The senior center is um, doing very well. We're loving our building. We had a flu clinic there today. We gave lots of tours to people after the clinic because it's their tax dollar and they're thrilled to see it that way. Um, Haley has done a really good job about doing what she refers to as a soft opening. 
with limited numbers of people in the building for limited times, no more than six in a group, obviously plus staff who's there all the time, and pretty much only one six person group a day. And people are happy to be back and happy to be out and able to get around. Great. Uh, Christian, you wanna jump in on the library and? Sure, yeah, the library uh, got their temp temporary certificate of occupancy. So they are able to start moving stuff in there. And um, I think the paving is supposed to happen next week, but it's weather dependent. Uh, so don't know exactly when it's gonna happen, but maybe hopefully before election day, that lot's paved, you know? Um, and that's about it there, I think. Um, they might move. I think they're talking tomorrow night more about when they're moving. However, it's been thrown out maybe the week of the election, um, just close the library and move everything from library to library. But we'll see when the move date is after tomorrow night. Did the sprinkler system and everything get resolved on that? I thought there was some discrepancies over there about the opening. Um, can you clue me in on that? I'm hearing two different things here. That might be Tommy since he's on the call here because I don't know that, yeah. Tommy, yes, Tommy. We, uh, yeah, we had some issues yesterday again with the inspection, but everything it, it's getting worked out. Um, you know, I, I mean, everything did get worked out. It just um, took a little longer and all. I didn't want to to bring that up. I don't want to put the blame on any, but um, Mike and I were a little discouraged yesterday, but we got it taken care of. Okay, so everything is a go then. Um, that's what I was hearing before. So I just yeah. wanted to make sure I'm hearing one thing from Christian and I heard something else. So if uh, that's great. I'm glad things are on a move. Thank you. Hey, yep. The other, the other um, news. Tommy, did you address that speed bump they got on the entrance? Did they do that on purpose <laughs> just to show us uh, that they can cause trouble or what? I, I actually reached out to DPW to see if they could, you know, put something there today and they had all the trucks, you know, tied up or whatever. But um, it is. I mean, the, the town car has trouble, so I can imagine, you know, some of the seniors trying to get in and out of there. Um, Put some gravel or some of that uh, chip that they're chipping right now a little bit and rake it around because the seniors must be having a hell of a time getting in that driveway in their little cars. Yes, I, I will reach out again to Scott or, or um, Chris tomorrow, but they couldn't get it today. But, you know, maybe tomorrow they could get something over there. It shouldn't take that much just to level it out a little bit. Yeah. That would be well appreciated by the seniors. The other news is that um, the Joint Library Senior Center signed, they dug the holes for the posts and within the week it should be up and permanent. Super. All right, Joyce, do you have anything for the fire station? Not really. Um, things are moving along. We have moved uh, materials into the North Hadley substation um as you know we're again doing um mike and everybody is working very diligent it's time consuming to you know get this set up for uh town meeting so he's been working on that um we also have um we have the halloween treats so things are going through there that are also going to be going through um the sub not the, the main fire station um, they're setting all that up today, and that's in conjunction with uh, Park and Rec and the fire and public safety. Um, and they're looking if anybody wants to volunteer uh, to sign up um, to do the trunk or treat. Um, and they're doing all kinds of things there. So please reach out to uh, Lauren at the uh, public safety. And uh, I guess the that's where you would reach out to if you want to participate in trunk or treat. All right. I'll give the, my update from the DPW is uh, Moody Bridge Road has been reclaimed ground down to gravel basically and regraded. Uh, it's being paved from Bay Road to the Sylvia Oconte <clears throat> uh, refuge um, into this month. I think it's the 30th is the most recent date. It's been pushed back a little bit. Basically all the paving contractors are delayed on 91 and the Orange Airport runway repaving project, which is pushing all the other projects back. 
Um, West Street was supposed to be milled today and tomorrow. Uh, they were able, it sounds like, to finish it today. So uh, that's going to be a rough ride for a couple weeks until that is paved at the end of the month as well. Um, so that's all I have there. And then um, let me just add about Halloween. I've gotten a bunch of questions about Halloween and I've, I put this out there. The governor has issued guidelines for Halloween, uh, best practices, masks, social distancing, things like that. And I put that link out there for people that want to take a look at it. Um, other than that, the town is not taking a stance one way or another. It's up to parents and families to decide uh, whether or not their kids should be going out or not. Um, and so, you know, I've gotten a lot of questions of whether we're canceling Halloween and, uh, it, you know, the town can't cancel holidays is the way I look at it. So that's up to parents to decide. Just be safe about it and have fun. And I think you need to add that as a town, um, our emergency safety people have offered this option of doing the trick or trunk trunk or treat however you want to say it so you know they have that option that they don't have to put their kids in jeopardy everything is going to be done safely um, at the fire station and I think that at this time I think that would behoove people to uh, do this type of thing with their children to keep them safe and keep their families safe I mean this is a thing that we need to do right now um mask and everything are going to be required. Stay tuned that we are going to send out what is exactly what the protocol is going to be. So um, we're not saying cancel it, but we're asking you to be safe and make sure that your families are safe. Yep, exactly. Uh, one question on the trunk or treat. You guys probably know better than me. Do you have to sign up ahead of time? And where would people uh, sign up for that? Do you know? People are, signing, people are signing up if they want to participate and be one of the trunk or treats. Okay. So all, all the candies and everything are going to be pre-wrapped, given to people to pass out. Um, and it, when you drive through, that's what's going to happen. So you don't have to sign up to drive through, um, but you do have to sign up if you want to be one of the participants um, and being the trunk that's open and receiving the candy. So they would like a call if you want to participate in that end of it. Yeah, that's us. And Joan Zusko is going to do the other one. So okay. we're doing one car and Joan's doing the other. <laughs> okay. So and they're only gonna, they're only going to have two cars, Dee Dee? So far as, as far as we know, but then the fire station is planning on doing their little thing right. too. So there'll yeah. be several different ones. There might be more than two. All right, so only only two cars are going to be passing out candy. Is what you're saying? No, no, no that's not right. They they have several cars passing out candy. Tommy, Dee Dee, and Joan will represent town hall. Okay, great. But there's 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 going to be lots of police officers and stuff, um, and their families, I believe, are the ones who are giving out the candy. And um, Chief Mason just binged in and said, "You don't have to sign up. Just come out and get candy." Okay. And what time is they're going to have plenty. What time is it? When do, when do people go there? I don't think five we've... to seven, I believe five yeah. to seven on the 31st. Friday. Okay. Friday. So people can pick one or the other or do both nights if they want. So, and uh, the important question, will there be Reese's? That's, that's the important question. Friday night is cabbage night. <laughs> <laughs> No peanut butter candy. Sorry, Sorry, David. Back in our day. <laughs> <laughs> no, I believe, I, I don't want to say which business it was, but there was $700 donated worth of candy from one business. And um, look at 44 is 300 in order to um, help with it. So there's a thousand dollars donated for it. <clears throat> oh, nice. Great. I, I tell you, Hadley is very blessed uh, with all of our businesses. I, I can say that. And I thank them publicly everybody that participates and our stores are just uh super um in helping us with all these things and projects and holidays you know can't live in a better place that's for sure john do you have any updates for park and rec or veterans or anything that you want to give or you good no not at this time 
Okay, and then uh, Carolyn, I skipped your administrator update. Did you have anything you wanted to cover? If I can, I'll, I'll do it real quick. Um, probably the most exciting part for me has been working with David going over the budget and his um, ability to analyze and predict. Um, and so we went over the uh, revenue for a year to date to the end of September. And um, his targets from the spring and putting this together, he's, he's right on target. It's been very interesting. So our um, the local receipts, state aid and real estate and personal property taxes, right on target, lower than last year, definitely. But he had he had uh, uh, predicted that, and um, his numbers are very close. So that was it was very interesting to see that. What is of concern is water and sewer. Um, those funds, those revenues are down. Sewer is down about fifty percent, and water is down about a third. And so we, that is an area, it's not uh, uncommon. The other communities surrounding us, probably throughout the state are experiencing the same thing, um, but we really need to monitor that closely. And I will be talking to Chris tomorrow about that. Um, the town departments are submitting, submitting eligible costs for the, the second round of COVID. Uh, the schools are getting, uh, the, from the CARES Act. So the schools are getting 225,000. They're eligible for that. The town's eligible for 250,000. Thank you to Jennifer and Deborah who've been um, working on that, gathering information from all the departments to uh, submit anything that they had to expend extra for um, to accommodate COVID impact. Um, and just quick about the uh, the early voting, Jessica, uh, the town clerk reported that it's going very well, about 50, averaging 50 people a day. So that's going to continue to to the 30th. Um, she also applied and received the $5,000 grant. To help pay for the purpose of planning and operational for the safety from COVID impact with planning for planning for the elections. And um, she wanted to remind everyone as well that on Monday, November 2nd at noon is the last day for voters to request an absentee ballot. This is mandatory and they will need to make an appointment with Jessica to do that. This is also the same day that is the early ballot, early ballot removal which will take place upstairs at 11 on November 2nd. And just to remind you that anyone wanting to observe the removal of the early voted ballots from the envelopes, um, they need to register by email to Jessica, which is clerk at hadleyma.org in advance. So I just wanted to get that word out. So that's it. Busy with lots of other stuff though. Carolyn, I just have one comment for you. Before <laughs> David goes anywhere, you yep. have to get his secret and how he gets these numbers right all the time. <laughs> it's, it, it has been, what, I t what I tell him all the time is, this is the best college class I ever took for, and got paid for it. But it, it really is remarkable. Um, there are, it, it's just, um, I cannot tell you what the benefit you have had with having David here. Over these, over these last 15 years with him, I don't seem to understand where he comes up with these numbers, but I'm so glad he does. So, <laughs> yep, and I'm learning a lot, and he's been a great teacher. So, great, great. I'm glad things are going well for you. Very Thank well. you. Very well. Good. I have a question about the ballot opening. So, the ballots are going to be opened and put into the voting machine at that point, or just confirm that they are registered voters? So you're above my skill set. I would have to ask Jessica that unless David might know that answer. I'm not sure. David, do you? Actually, I wouldn't I wouldn't presume to uh, to say. I think we need to get that information from Jessica. Susan may have that answer. <laughs> Jessica said this year they are allowed to actually put them into the ballot uh, into the ballot box, feed them in earlier because they expected such a, a large volume. And I just, I just want to say that uh, I'm leaving the, the town in very good hands in, in Carolyn. She's, uh, she's going to serve you very well. Thank you. Well, thank you, David. Thanks for, uh, how do I, precepting her. I guess that's how I'm going to put that's it. That's what I'm going to call him. It was mentor, but now I think it's good. It's my preceptor. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. <laughs> that's the word I use in nursing. We that's precept. Right. <laughs> but I'll get that answer for you, Jane, if you'd like, because we'll touch base tomorrow anyways. 
All right. Any other announcements before we wrap up tonight? No, I'm lax on that tonight. Mine, my end of it. Okay. All right. So we'll see everybody next Wednesday. Again, two weeks in a row. Yeah. Just for you, Joyce. Thank you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Have we set a date for the forum before town meeting? Uh, yes. Let's see. It's the 28th. You're going to have a split meeting. You're going to do select board till seven o'clock. And at seven o'clock, you'll start your forum. On the 28th. Yeah. Even though the meeting isn't until the 14th. I mean, you could change it, but that's what y'all had said at a previous meeting. Yeah, okay. we usually we usually do it a few weeks ahead of time just to get people aware of what's going on. There's not much on them anyway, so no, no. We shouldn't take this the, We need to be posted, I believe, that Friday. So um, I mean, really the twenty eighth is the last time we can make any changes anyways. So, you know, we'll, we will be all set to do a forum that evening, one way or another. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, just I my calendar might not be synced up. So do we have a meeting then on the fourth too? Because I have it on the as the fourth and the eighteenth. I do not have one listed on the fourth. Okay. Uh, the fourth, but, the fourth of November. Yeah. yeah. Let, let me check. I, I'm not sure. I'll get. Okay. I'll, I'll let you know next week for sure. But we do have one next Wednesday, the twenty eighth. Okay. Yeah, I can note that. But yeah, if we could just maybe, maybe just uh, note next week what our schedule is, just so we have it all the same. Because maybe it does have to change with town meeting being on the fourteenth. No, you know what? You're right. It's under board docs and the drafts. We do have one scheduled for the fourth and the eighteenth. So you are correct. So yeah, okay. I have it on the I have it on the fourth. Yeah. So you're right. I think we had added this to deal with the town meeting delay, and that that's why we had an extra one on the twenty eighth. Okay. Yep, so Fabulous. Yeah. Fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> we did it for you, George. <laughs> I love I love meetings. I mean, I, that's my life. I love it. Yeah. I'm not at hey, the beach any I'm not at the beach anymore. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and any other campers yeah, home, so now you got plenty of time to spend with us. Oh, I love spending time with you guys. Absolutely. All right, last call for announcements. All right. Can I get a motion to adjourn, please? Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Good night, everyone. All right. Have a good week, everybody. Bye.